Mr. Rail has been promoted to the, as a panelist. All right, I'm going to call um, the Oceanside Unified School District closed session school board meeting Tuesday, June 8, 2021. And we have a public comment. I want to go ahead and Michael Real, you have three minutes to provide a public comment for our closed session. You ready? Are all board members present, Dr. Began? Um, I am missing, who are we well, missing, like Julie? Trustee Joyce and um, Mr. Can, Blessing. Uh, Mike's not in the meeting right now and Eric can hear you. Okay. All right, and when does my time start? whenever you start. All right, Good afternoon, board trustees. Um, we are in, uh, there's an evaluation that is going to be um, taking place uh, in this closed session. And uh, I feel that it is necessary to go ahead and evaluate um, school board members uh, be as, um, because um, it has been uh, quite the experience going through this uh, through this pandemic and this school year. Um, first off, I want to thank Trustee Alvarez for always keeping her ear to the ground and always making sure that she is leading and um, listening with intent. Um, I have to say that uh, any phone call or anything that you have to reach out, you always have um, made sure to make it a point in order to call and also get the information. Um, in regards to the rest of the board members, I can't say that that is um, necessarily true for everyone. Um, Mr. Joyce, um, I'm very, as you know, disappointed in your leadership within this um, district. Um, it appeared at uh, the beginning of the school year we were there was a, it appeared, and I know that your uh, view is different, that there was a political ploy or push to reopen schools prematurely, even to the extent uh, that you were claiming to follow science when the rise of cases was on the up and up. And uh, there, as working for a community, one of the most marginalized communities and even more so, even the most marginal population within this district, you still utilized your special education credential in order to bolster and uh, promote this reopening and even pushing to reopen uh, mod severe when you don't even hold a mod severe credential. Um, and it really put a damper, not just on myself, but other teachers within the district. As you know, we did go ahead and do involuntary services, but we did it because we were looking to do it and promote it in a safe manner. Unfortunately, the way that everything was promoted in order to reopen from you as well as administration ended up not being, in my opinion, the best. And obviously, since we had to close, the most uh, appropriate as well as safe. Um, safety is number one concern. Mr. Real, there's about 30 seconds remaining. Dr. Begin, I'm going to go ahead and say that I, although I am very fortunate to have the, uh, the opportunity to go ahead and speak and, ha and call you a sister, um, there has been times where uh, you have also bitten into the political ploy. And unfortunately, um, we're kind of in this space right now. For the rest of the board members, Mike and Eleanor, I can't say that I have any kind, right. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of communication elsewhere. Thank you. Really, truly the one piece that this, uh, Thanks, that Michael. is really being illuminated in this district, so. Um, with Thank that, you, Michael. I, Your time is up. Sorry. I understand, Dr. Begin. But I mean, we don't have a whole lot of time to talk. Dr. Begin, I've placed Michael back in the audience. Ooh, in that's going to go over well. All right. Thank you. We have no more comments for our closed session. Okay. Do we stay in this for closed session? No, nope, we go into our closed session room.
So you can leave this meeting and then we'll come back to uh, open session and announce any action taken in closed session. Are we ready? Yeah, I think so. All right, welcome everyone to the Oceanside Unified School District, Tuesday, June 8, 2021, Board of Education regular meeting. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I would like to do a call to order. Um, we are starting at 6.15 p.m. I'm gonna call the meeting to order and a quick roll call. So colleagues, when I say your name, we just say here. I'll start with Eleanor Evans. Present. Mike Blessing. Here. Eric Joyce. I think that was you here. Raquel Alvarez. Present. All right, everybody's accounted for, great. I'm moving out to item 2B, public report of action that was taken in closed session. We only have two items to report out tonight. Item 1C, public employee appointment, principal, government code 54956.95. The board voted 3-2 to appoint Nicole Hendricks as the principal of Laurel Elementary School. Item 1E, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, government code 54956.9, student versus Oceanside Unified School District, OHA case number 202102016. By the following vote, 5-0, the governing board ratified a settlement agreement reached by the parties in the OHA case number 2021020016, in which the district agrees to fund an amount not to exceed $21,450 for educational expenses and attorney fees and resolved all issues in dispute regarding the 2020 2021 school year and all prospective claims through the remainder of the 2020 2021 school year. Thank you. Moving on, um, Julie, do we want to? switch some things up or the student representatives? I, I think we're okay. Uh, okay. Stacy. just move forward with the student representative and then we'll get on to the next item. I think we're good. All right, super. So item 2C, student representatives, we have Irie Nichols from OHS. Irie, are you ready? Yes. Welcome, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Thank you for allowing me to share what's happening at Oceanside High School. We are excited about the more than 700 students who have committed to participate in one or more of our summer programs, such as POP, the Pirate Opportunity Program, Math Boot Camp, and PALs, Pirate Academy for Leaders. Some of these programs offer the opportunity to earn additional credits, but they all provide the opportunity to rediscover learning. Some other highlights from the past month include teachers and staff distributed the last of our senior yard signs on Saturday, June 5th. For the first time in a long time, OHS has a championship winning boys volleyball team. Our boys basketball team are Avocado League championship um, champions. Laura Ramirez, made it to the final round of the CIF Tennis Championship. Our Valid Victorian, Khalil Hernandez, was presented with the High School Sports Association Scholar Athletes Award and a scholarship. Our seniors are preparing for graduation in person in the stadium, but the rest of us look forward to return to the band show in the coming years. On behalf of the teachers and staff and students of OHS, thank you for helping us stay safe and remain well. We are looking forward to the 2021 to 2022 school year. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Irie, for your report. Moving on to item 2D, approval of agenda. I'll call for a motion. Move to approve. Second. I got a first and a second. No discussion. I'll call for a vote. All in favor of tonight's agenda? Aye. 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 
All right, motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item three, superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Begin. I'm uh, pleased to yield my time to Congressman uh, Levin, who has joined us this evening to provide us some information on the impact of the American uh, Rescue Act. And Congressman, we appreciate your support of public, public education and Oceanside Unified, and we're uh, proud to welcome you to our meeting. So uh, please take the time that you need um, to talk to the Board of Education. Well, thank you so much. What an honor to be with you all. Uh, I wanna thank uh, all of our board members and our teachers, our faculty, and, and all the parents and all the students uh, who have worked so hard over the last year uh, through an unprecedented time. And uh, I, I just take my hat off to everyone involved for providing the best possible education for our children under extremely challenging circumstances. I can tell you, uh, my wife and I were excited when our uh, eight-year-old and seven-year-old just wrapped up their school year uh, that next year, hopefully Knockwood will be a normal uh, school year for them in fourth grade and in second grade. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, from our own experience and from hearing from so many constituents remote learning, we've made the best of it, but it has not been easy, hasn't been easy for anyone. Uh, fortunately, we are turning the corner on this pandemic. Uh, we got the great news about the yellow tier uh, today and even better news coming in a week on June 15th. Uh, and my great hope is that the American Rescue Plan that we passed that was signed into law uh, by President Biden will really help uh, Oceanside Unified and, and all of our schools reopen safely. Uh, and uh, Oceanside Unified uh, in particular is estimated to receive nearly 47 million dollars from the American Rescue Plan, uh, everything from uh, reopening safely to helping our students catch up on lost learning. Uh, the funding is flexible. It can be used for things like reducing class sizes, modifying spaces to allow for social distancing, uh, to invest in be better ventilation and PPE, to enhance summer school programs, which I know is really uh, exciting and uh, more. And I, I trust that you're gonna use it well, that, that funding from the American Rescue Plan. I know that the uh, US Department of Education is working to get that funding to you as quickly as possible. Uh, and I'm excited to see the investments that you're gonna be making on behalf of students and teachers. I look forward to visiting uh, with you uh, later in the summer and in the fall in person, hopefully to see some of those investments firsthand. Uh, and if you have any questions at all about the funding or any other priorities that our office can help with, please do not hesitate to reach out. I know our district director, Francine Busby is on, and I know uh, Kyle Crail from Oceanside, our deputy district director would love nothing more than to help uh, the great city of Oceanside and specifically uh, you in these school districts. So please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done during this difficult year, everything you're continuing to do for our children. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our superintendent. Thanks again. Thank you, Congressman. And again, thank you so much for your advocacy for public education. Uh, it is much appreciated. All right, Dr. Begin, back to you. All right, super. So we move on to item four, board reports. Do I have a volunteer to go first? Bueller? I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll go first. All right, thanks, Elner. Okay. Um, happy Pride Month to everyone. Okay, this month, I should say last month was Memorial Day and I wanna observe even though it's May 31st, but it's very important holiday for this nation and more importantly for my family. This month, I had the opportunity to, to view, because it was virtual, the Crystal Apple Award and I wanna congratulate those teachers who received that award. We also had the opportunity to go to the Career Tech Education um, workshops. It was phenomenal, the projects that these students are doing. And personally, I think CTE is, is going to be one of the waves of the future in education. I need to also remind everyone that June 10th, or Juneteenth is um, on June 10th, and it recognizes the fact that slavery, legal slavery in the United, in the United States finally ended two years after Lincoln had um, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And um, 
it ended because the cavalry, the US cavalry had to go to Texas and announce that, hey, you can't have slaves anymore. So there we are, all right? Thanks, Eleanor, for going first. Raquel. Mine's gonna be a long one. Um, I have a couple of things. I went to a Santo promotion and I was able to attend all three of those promotions for each of the teachers, which were amazing. Seeing the students um, to be actually to, to have each classroom full and complete in one small area or outside was amazing and awesome. And just the stories that they had to share. Um, I was also able to um, attend the SLR promotion this morning, which is amazing. Also um, seeing the achievements of the students and where they've come and how they progressed. And they didn't let this um, pandemic get the best of them. And they still fought through every moment of it to do the best that they possibly could. Um, I was able to go to also the EC award ceremony for scholarships, which was amazing and seeing the scholars um, and the amount of money that went out in scholarships to those students. And it was just, it was awesome. Um, being able to be in the Truex because it's amazing. It looks beautiful now also. And so um, just being able to be in there with the families, enjoying every moment of the, the job well done for all of those students is, was great. Um, I was able to re, um, attend a retirement party for our teachers um, through ODA and hearing the stories from the teachers and the staff um, for our school district, um, moments of laughter and moments of tears because you see the love and the passion that our teachers have for our students and the true passion that they have for Oceanside. And with that, I would like to take a moment to recognize the staff that is retiring or that has retired last year and this year through the pandemic and everything. Um, I apologize now in advance for the pronunciation of names, but I know that um, I want to make sure that you all understand that I appreciate all the work and support that you all have all given our students, um, each one of them for not only our students, but for our families in this community for Oceanside Unified. And I thank you all very much. And I'm going to go through a list. So uh, bear with me um, as I read every name and acknowledge every person that is retiring through um, for our classified. I'll start with them. I have Gail Adams with 20 years, um, Juanito Basins with eight years, Stephen Brooks, 25 years, Mary Duarte, 28 years, James Dvorak, 24 years, Linda Effie, 16 years, um, James Egid Nissen, 20 years, William Ferguson, 25 years, Ida Fine, 32 years, Nancy Gardner, 10 years, Julieta Gonzalez, 18 years, Irma Jaramillo, 29 years, Karen Jones, 14 years, Michelle Dudo, 19 years, Luis Ladrido, 24 years, Amita Muro, 24 years, um, Vigo Rasmussen, 31 years, Susan Rydell, six years, Bonnie Robinson, 12 years, Cynthia Skaggs, 11 years, James Siling, 25 years, Vicki Spear, 27 years, David Sprint, 20 years, Jesus Tarango, seven years, Roland Thomason, 23 years, Total, just with the classified, that's 498 years. It's amazing. And now um, for our certificated, I have Juanita Manuelos Hernandez, Debbie Couillard, Anna um, Covarrubias Kelly, Tina De La Rosa, Brenda Dolan, Michelle Engelston, Georgianne Fierce, Michael Hargrove, Rebecca Kennington, Thomas Kimbrell, Gina Long, Raquel Berry, sorry, um, Nancy Martinelli, Dana McCullough, Dorothy Misereni, Kathleen Morrison, Michael Nealon, Kathleen O'Sullivan, Lori Peruz Peruzzo, Angela Pedotti, Vonda Rogers, Paul Ruiz Jr., Maureen Shea Weston, um, George Tabler II, Lori Tauber, Don Teslek, Renee Trellis, Debbie Trussell, Leslie Valerio, Mary Wykenot, Jean Wickersham, and Carmel Zimney. Um, with this, uh, 
if we look at everyone that retired, we have a combined 1,211 years of service to our Oceanside Unified School students from classified and certificated. I thank you all very much. I appreciate all your hard work. We will miss you. Remember, um, you're always family within this community. We will love you and miss you and appreciate everything that you have done for our families. Thank you. Thanks, Raquel, for doing that. Um, Eric. Last month, I attended several um, committees, including the renaming committee and, and some of the um, committees that are looking at, at building in our school sites. And I also had the opportunity to go to the CTE uh, exhibition, which is fascinating. Some of the things that kids do. I mean, they're working with drones and doing photography. There's kids working with wood. Um, there, are, There's this incredible range of skills that, that the kids are, are bringing forward and and working with our community partners in and i love to see that combination of of um of growth and, and partnership across the community so it was beautiful i'm excited to do it next year and to really have that exhibition um blown up because i know everybody from the from town wanted to come but because of restrictions we we couldn't quite do that so i'm, I'm really excited about uh, the growth in that area and then I got to go to an OHS basketball game and it was a heartbreaker, but I was at a high school basketball game. It was so much fun. It was almost normal. So um, happy Pride Month. And I am, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to see everybody um, taking pride in, in the accomplishments of our scholars over the next week. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. Mike. You're on mute. <laughs> yes, I was, thank you. I had the opportunity to attend the uh, grand opening of the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony at the new hotels down by the beach resort um, last Thursday. And it was um, truly a, a magnificent facility. I have personal bled over that project for 20, 30 some years as a city staffer. Um, and I wasn't there for the last 10 years of it, uh, but the, this current developer was with the project for 17 years. And I was on the team that picked him to uh, up this site and they did a knockout job. It's fantastic. And they've also set up a very unique um, training exercise where they hired a bunch of our staffers out of the career tech unit out of Ocean, Oceanside High and El Camino to work in the hospitality industry there. And um, that was good news to hear from them, but it's a wonderful facility. And I, I think we're actually have a meeting we're having there, some workshop uh, coming up. So it's a just fantastic. It's a great asset to the community. I'm glad we're all be able to use it. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thanks, Mike. Well, um, I did a couple of things with other board members, like the Crystal Apple Awards, which was great. I also was invited to the Oceanside Teacher Association Retirement. And that was awesome to see and meet all those teachers and hear their stories about their years of teaching. It was great. Um, I also took part in mock interviews at El Camino High School. These were virtual with their juniors organized by Chris Hawkins. And I wanted to give a shout out and kudos to the students I interviewed because they were amazing. So organized with their brag sheets, their soft skills, their hard skills. They went into their five-year plan. They were so articulate. It was awesome. So I want to say thank you to Kylie Anderson, Milan Tai, Ileana Mendez, Jeshua Polanka, Elmer Rodriguez, Elijah Morell, Zachary Wendell, Clive Moya, and Alfonso Lopez. You guys did a great job. And last but not least, I did a site visit over at Surfside. Academy and high school, and I learned all kinds of information about the difference between distance learning and independent study and how it works. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the teachers over there. They're working super hard and super dedicated for our students. So thanks. Um, moving on to item five, general consent items. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval of consent items. I'll second. All right, I have a first and a second. Any discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of the general consent items? Aye. 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 Aye.
Motion carries 5-0. I was looking at you guys. All right, the next one, item six, presentations. I'll turn this over to staff for item A, Beyond the Blueprint. Yes, so while we're uh, queuing up the presentation, uh, we hope that what we have tonight is our last presentation to the Board of Education on COVID-19. Uh, as we look to move beyond the blueprint, um, as expressed by the governor, um, the blueprint um, should be ending on June 15th. So um, while Greg puts that in presentation mode, um, We'll just be giving an update on our previous decision, uh, what's happening now uh, with the vaccine, a little bit more about uh, where case rates are. We got a lot of good news today. And then also talking a little bit about our summer school uh, program. So it appears we're having some technical difficulty, so that's okay. Uh, we'll just be patient um, while we get this up and running. This is just a sign that we need to continue to uh, move uh, towards that full opening uh, so that we can resume our meetings in person as well. So thank you, uh, Greg, if you'll move to the next slide, we'll just remind the Board of Education of previous direction uh, that we will return um, for full in-person learning using pre-pandemic school hours at all grade levels for the 21-22 school year. And we very much look forward to that and all signs point to yes as we did receive good information today, but that's for Dr. Levy to share in uh, the next couple of slides. So if we'll move on to the next slide and uh, Mercedes Levy, uh, who has guided us through this, that has understood COVID uh, so deeply and the ramifications and all of the science, she really has become a different kind of Dr. Levy through this Mercedes. And we all thank you for your leadership in that as you've really understood this pandemic at a very deep level. So uh, with that, I will um, send that to you, Mercedes. Thank you, Dr. Vitale, it's very nice. Uh, so very excited to say that we have had some very positive change, changes since May 11th. Uh, we have had significant progress against COVID-19. Um, this is great news as we have had additional vaccine distribution, 12 year olds and above are eligible for vaccine. And we have confirmation today that the California tiered system will expire on June 15th. Uh, next slide, please. So throughout this pandemic, the board has had, uh, we've always made sure that we have presented a health and safety and educational outcome plan and we will continue to do so tonight. Next slide, please. So the most recent uh, vaccine updates uh, show that 2 million San Diegans have received at least one dose of the vaccine and almost 80% uh, of, of um, San Diegans within the target population, which is 75% of all eligible people for vaccine are fully vaccinated. And we continue to have additional um, progress daily on meeting this goal. Next slide, please. We wanted to make sure that we reminded everyone that all people 12 years old and older in San Diego County and in the state of California are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. And that here in Oceanside, we have a no appointment needed vaccine location right here on Mission Avenue, um, every, uh, uh, Sunday through Thursday from 9 to 3.30 p.m. Next slide, please. As a direct result of the deployment of the vaccines, you can see a historical bar graph of the uh, 15 months that we have been experiencing. If you look to the far left of the bar graph, you will see the week of uh, March 7th through 13th, which is when uh, we went to the shutdown. There were 19 lab confirmed cases of COVID-19 at that time. The very next week, which was uh, March 14th through March 20th, that jumped to 99 uh, lab confirmed cases. Um, and such, since that time, we have reached a height in January of 24,000 uh, lab confirmed cases um, in San Diego County um, in January. The good news is uh, that we are now below 58 as of the Mar uh, May 29th day. And so we have made significant progress. Um, very good news for our community. Next slide, please. When we look at San Diego County, we are glad to know that we are under two 
COVID-19 cases per 100,000. Um, as our congressman uh, shared, we are in the yellow tier, which is the lowest tier as a county. And uh, this is continuing to be very good progress. And if you look, there are 13 indicators throughout the pandemic that we have been monitoring uh, for the health and safety of our community. Um, this is the very first week that we have green in all of our indicators, which is very, very good news. And if you look at case rates at 1.7, um, that's the lowest we've had. And if you look at community outbreaks of just four, at the height of pandemic, we were looking at about 75 uh, community outbreaks um, in any seven day period. Next slide, please. So we know that after June 15th, that we will be going beyond the blueprint. And this will be uh, key to making sure that we have li let fewer limits on uh, events, that we will only need to be having vaccine verification and negative testing for indoor mega events, uh, which is uh, 2,000 people or recommended for 10,000 outdoor mega events. The capacity limitations will be uh, removed. Physical distancing will be reduced and face covering will still be required um, in the workplace based on Cal OSHA guidance for workers. So uh, face coverings will be required if not everyone is uh, fully vaccinated in a workplace. Next slide, please. So looking forward, uh, we wanna be thinking about our academic program. Uh, we've shared with you, we have a summer school programming that will have targeted um, instruction that will accelerate student learning uh, in the mornings. And in the afternoons, we're going to be offering uh, a robust uh, enrichment program with the arts, with science and PE for our students. Uh, we reached out to families, we asked about their interest and our teachers have stepped up. So uh, because of our teachers, staff, and principals, uh, we will be offering summer school programming at all of our sites. In kindergarten through eighth grade, we have uh, 2,600 students uh, enrolled in summer school. And at the high school, we have 1,800 students enrolled for a total of 3,000, approximately 3,400 students enrolled in our summer programming. Um, this is really wonderful news for our families and our community, and we're definitely excited and grateful to everyone who's worked so hard on this planning. Next slide, please. One of the things that we wanted to be looking at is how students have done during this virtual learning instructional time. So uh, we wanted to share with you the iReady data. So in this uh, slide, what you will see at the top of it is the 1920 school year. This was the first year that we had iReady assessments. Uh, we would have liked to show you three years worth of data, but we only had two. So in our design, we have three windows, which we assess students with iReady. And in that year, we did kindergarten through eighth grade. In the first administration, you can see um, in the triangle, the green is those students who are meeting grade level standards as measured by end of year targets. Yellow are those that are slightly below and red are those students who are furthest away from that. For all of the windows, we're reporting this based on the end of the year um, standard view. So you can see in window, window one, we had 26% of our students who at the start of the window were meeting grade level standards right as they entered that grade level. In window two, you can see that increased to 37% of the students were in tier one. And then window three, because of the sudden closure for uh, in-person instruction, we did not administer a window three for COVID, uh, sorry, for iReady due to COVID-19. If we move forward to, this is again in reading, to this year in the 2021 school year, you can see that students at the very beginning of the year, 32% of them were meeting grade level standards at the beginning of the year. 29% were slightly below and 38% were at risk, which was far further below. And then you can see that there was a steady increase uh, between window one, window two and window three. And all of these are measured based on end of the year standards. So in window one, we had 32% of our students meeting grade level standards. When we went to window three, we have 45% of our students meeting grade level standards in reading level placement. The next slide is our math. This also shows the same data, but this is our math level placement. 
You can see in window one, tier one, or our students who um, are meeting grade level standards uh, in 1920 was 18 percent. It grew to 29 percent. And then when we went to the fall in 2021, we were at 23 percent. And we have seen a growth of 38 percent of our students who are meeting um, end of the year targets. But also, if you can see, we've also reduced the number of students who are at risk or for tier three who have moved up a level. So we want to make sure we're constantly thinking about continuous improvement and moving forward and growth for all of our students. Next slide, please. Dr. Levy. Yes, sir. This is under the standard view. Yes, sir. So the standard view, um, this also is reporting based on the standard view. So what we have in this is the iReady reading. Uh, this is a different way to look at the data. In this uh, bar graph, you see uh, reading in 1920 for window one and window two. And where you see the um, green that has the hash marks on it, that is mid or above grade level for that window. When you look at the solid green, that is the early on in the grade level. So you can see that those are how we had more and more students who were also meeting those grade level standards. The numbers at the bottom, starting on the left, which is 1830 students, that's the number of students who are in each of those bands that you see across the bottom. Next slide, please. This is also the reading window, but this is for 2021. So you can see that we had a larger number of students who were assessed this year because we did expand the testing into our high school students. Um, mostly that was done on an optional level. And you can see that we again started off uh, with a, at the beginning of 32% of our students being at uh, or above grade level and then moved on as you can see progressing each and every time in our reading. Next slide, please. This is the math where you can see that our math uh, achievement levels tend to be a little bit lower than that in our ELA, uh, which we can see only 17%. When we first administered the iReady assessment, we're at grade level, but then as we move up, we see we had 29%. And again, continuing to reduce the number of students who are in that three or more grade levels below or two or more grade levels below. Next slide. This is the data from 2021 school year and we have again an increase each window based on the standards view of the children making progress step by step um, in their achievement. So as much as we are happy to see students in the grade level, we are also glad to see that the students are moving from one band to another. Next slide, please. This uh, graphic is around reading. And this one, let me explain this one to you. This is produced based on cohort data. So cohort data means that we take the same grouping of students and we look at them over time. So what this is, is looking at students, how they're making that goal. So we set the goal to be mid grade level. And so if we can see that the imaginary line underneath the title, let's say that that is the goal. So we would want all of the students to be hitting that goals. If you look at the bottom, you see that it says that we have a, uh, a, a key with different colors showing fall of 2019, which was the first administration. Then you have winter of 2019, which was the second administration. Then you have this year, 2020 in the fall, winter 2020 and spring of 2021. So let's look at the third grade set of data for reading. If you look at that dark uh, blue bar, what that shows is that our students were 71 points below the average distance from mid grade level. But because it's a cohort, when we look at third grade, that 71 is when these third graders were in second grade. So that's in the fall of second grade. If you look at the next line, which shows 47, that is also when the students were in second grade with a growth. If you look at the third line, this is when the third graders were in the fall of this year with again 47 away from our target. If you look at the next line, this was the spring administration, 
which means that they were only 40 points away from our target. And if you look at the third law, the, I'm sorry, the fifth line, they were 36 away from that goal. So just like golf, uh, we, the number you wanna have is the lower number. So you can see across our grade levels, students in cohort have made progress along each of those levels. So again, it's a cohort. So if you were then to give another example, if you were looking at sixth grade, that line that the cursor is pointing at was when those sixth graders were in fifth grade in the fall, fifth grade in the winter, now in sixth grade in the fall, sixth grade in the winter, and sixth grade in the spring. And this is also based on whatever the uh, assessment would be. So the fifth graders took fifth grade assessments and the sixth graders took sixth grade assessments. So this is the I ready over time. Dr. Levy, I have uh, one more question. The winter levels, was that uh, administration time period when the students were still on distance learning or was that when they were back in the classroom? In 2019, they would have been in the classroom. In 2020, uh, the winter, they would have been remote. There would have been some remote. It would have been mixed because again, not everybody went back at the same time because of our secondary schools. Right, okay. All right, next slide. This slide in green is designed in the same way, but this shows our math data cohort over time. So with this, if we go back to our third grade example, our third graders average distance from their target or the mid level goal was 48 points. Then in the winter, they moved ahead and they were only 40 points away from the target. In the fall, they were 39 points away from the target, but in the winter, 34, and then in the final administration, 27 points on average away from the goal. So again, as you can see, what we're looking for is an upward tra trajectory and improvement over time by cohort. And this is definitely, um, you know, we would like to see, of course, we always wanna see more growth, but we feel like this is very positive in the direction. And again, once we return to in-person learning, we can expect to see even more growth. But this is due to the hard work of our teachers, our families, our students, and our community to make sure that we maintain high quality instruction. Next slide, please. So as we are looking at the educational outcomes, what we really want to be thinking about is rediscovering the joy and purpose in education. Joy, love, gratitude, and purpose. So we are gonna be looking at making sure that we are engaging with all of our families and our students, that the students want to be here, that they feel connected and have positive relationships with people on staff and in their community, and that they have intentional support for whatever they need and that students receive what they need when they need it in the way they need it. Next slide, please. The way that we're gonna be able to do this is definitely around the high quality staff in Oceanside Unified School District. We're gonna to continue to focus on a rigorous and relevant curriculum and make sure that we have materials that meet the needs of our students. We will use the best practices in instructional strategies. We will continue with our progress monitoring using our iReady and STAR assessments and be focusing on MTSS with targeted tiered supports for all of our students so that over time we can make sure that our students are prepared for the future and that we have addressed uh, the gap in their in-person learning and make sure that they have all the tools they need to be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Levy, for that presentation. Board members, do you have any comments? Questions? Just looking at the data and something that we'll have, to, you know, we can talk about later at LCAP, but it looked like the math in particular for fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth was extremely challenging over the past year. And I can imagine why, I mean, learning, teaching fifth and sixth grade math can be difficult, <laughs> much less uh, with all the challenges they face. So that looked like a particular area of need. And I'm just kind of thinking ahead when we look at planning next year, what kind of specific supports for math instruction we might wanna think about too. 
I was right. thinking just the opposite. I've, I'm, I'm very impressed with the growth in math. I'm surprised that math scores demonstrated more growth than the reading um, scores did. But overall, um, considering the circumstances, I think this district did a very good job. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I, I will share uh, anecdotally that I uh, met with a family this week who had a child in a neighboring district. Uh, one in a neighboring district and one in our district. And they were extremely complimentary saying that the quality of the instruction that we provided in Oceanside and the talent of the teachers and the amount of time that they had in synchronistic learning with the child who was in Oceanside was far superior to that in the neighboring district. Um, and that was uh, without any um, requests. So it was very good to hear that we uh, provided the services to the families that, and they're appreciating it. Oceanside rocks, what can you say? Great. All right, we're moving on to item 6B, which is the public hearing for consideration to rename San Luis Rey Elementary School. And hey, we're ahead of schedule. So I'm gonna open the hearing at 6.56 p.m. And if we could hear from Matthew Jennings, our Director of Communications, if you wanna share a little bit about what's going on, it's all you. Thank you very much. What a great presentation to follow. And I agree, Oside rocks. So good evening, President Begin, board members, Superintendent Vitale, Executive Cabinet, and all those in attendance in our audience this evening. We're here to share with you the recommendations for the renaming of San Luis Rey Elementary School. During this presentation, we will discuss the establishment of the San Luis Rey Elementary School Renaming Citizen Advisory Committee and the objective of the process, a little background, purpose, some criteria, and ultimately the committee's top three recommendations for board consideration this evening. Before I begin, I must recognize and thank the members of the committee, these amazing individuals volunteered to serve their community through the momentous process of renaming an elementary school. They accomplished this with compassion, not only for each other, but deep, compassion for their community. And the committee's recommendations this evening reflect significant consideration, deliberation, community input, and they are culturally relevant. Next slide, please. So just to cover the objective really quickly, it was to create a committee comprised of a diverse group of Oceanside community members that would work through the process formally of selecting a new name for San Luis Rey Elementary School. Next slide, please. So San Luis Rey and Garrison Elementary Schools, as a brief recap and reminder, were combined during the 2019 and 20 school year. During that process, it was determined that the two school communities would remain together and undergo a rename change to unite as one community and one school. A formal committee was formed to navigate that process the committee is a citizen advisory committee established with board policy, and it's a 7-Eleven committee modeled after that 7-Eleven, which means seven members at minimum, not to exceed 11. And um, once that committee was established, uh, they elected two co-chairs who assisted in guiding the process and ensuring the fidelity of the recommendations the committee ultimately is presenting to the Board of Education here this evening. Suggestions were solicited from the community at large, and the committee is here to present their top three name recommendations. Next slide, please. So when the OUSD Board of Education established the formal process for renaming San Luis Rey Elementary School, that began in November, 2020, and it, it started a process that spanned the next six months. The first step was establishing the 7-Eleven committee, of course, that we just discussed. And ultimately, 17 applications were received from the Oceanside community at large. When those applications were received and the window was closed, all personally identifying information was removed from those applications, and a third party of district staff reviewed them and selected our 11 committee members. Our committee members represent longtime Oceanside residents, teachers, district staff, former students. In fact, one of our committee members is a former student of both Garrison and San Luis Rey Elementary School. It includes the captain of the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians, 
and two board members. During the first committee meeting, we established the process to open the name suggestion window and online form to the community and the committee elected their two co-chairs. While names were being received, the committee met to establish our purpose and criteria for name selection. When the window closed in February, more than 330 name submissions had been received. Ultimately, the committee met eight times to narrow this list down to their top three recommendations for the board's consideration that we will present to you in just a moment. Next slide, please. The two committee co-chairs that helped lead the work were Alan Sanders and Michael Arce. I'm going to turn it over now to Alan, who will share some additional details about the committee's process and the committee's top three name recommendations. As one of the two selected co-chairs, I would like to remind everyone of the purpose of this committee. Our goals were to consider names that would be a reflection of both San Luis Rey and the greater Oceanside geographic community, while considering a name that would rebrand San Luis Rey due to the merging of Garrison and San Luis Rey communities. This work was done while keeping in mind submissions needed to be culturally sensitive, equitable, and social justice oriented. Next slide, please. An overview of the criteria used to evaluate the hundreds of submissions from the community at large included. Recent and current political figures would not be submitted. The names being brought forth should already have associated significance. Also keeping in mind any and all historical implications associated with the names presented be not only historically significant, but also educated and culturally significant. Community oriented. And as one final note, the submissions from the community were just that submissions. No voting was to be done as part of that process. Next slide, please. Additionally, this process is governed by board policy 7310 that states the board shall name district schools and other district owned or leased buildings, grounds, and facilities in recognition of individuals living or deceased and entities that have made outstanding contributions, including financial contributions to the school community, individuals living or deceased who have made contributions of statewide, national, or worldwide significance, the geographic area in which the school or building is located. Next slide, please. On behalf of this committee, the top three recommendations being presented to the board for considerations include Dolores Huerta, Pablo Tak, John Lewis. Next slide, please. Thanks, Alan. So to begin with Dolores Huerta, uh, born in 1930, Dolores Huerta is a labor activist and leader of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. She is the co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association and served as the vice president of the United Farm Workers Union. During the 1970s and 1980s, Huerta worked to improve workers' legislative representation and women's rights. As a civil rights and labor activist, Dolores Huerta has dedicated her life to uplifting Hispanic and Latinx communities, particularly those in connection to agricultural labor. Dolores was an educator and has also fought to elect more Latinx people and women to political office. Huerta worked to improve workers' legislative representation and women's rights, and her commitment to the human rights illustrate Commitment to human rights illustrates the importance of community, organization, leadership, and devotion. Next slide, please. Pablo Tak is a, uh, a respected Luiseño scholar and hero. His writings were the primary source of Luiseño language and culture written by a Luiseño up until the 20th century. He was born at Mission San Luis Rey in 1820. 
He was determined to capture Luiseño language, history, and oral traditions, and his writings reinforced the sense of Luiseño equality and dignity. Pablo Tak is the first Luiseño to attend college. Tak lent a perspective on the institutions and early history of Southern California and Mission San Luis Rey, and also wrote on the customs and traditions of the Luiseño peoples. Pablo Tak serves as a reminder of the powerful presence of indigenous peoples of this land, which we now occupy. Next slide, please. John Lewis was a civil rights leader and one of the original 13 Freedom Riders, working tirelessly to challenge transportation segregation in the Southern United States. He was also a leader in a coalition titled the Big Six and later the Big Ten, who organized the March on Washington. He was a founding member and chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and dedicated his life to ending racial segregation and lifting the voices of Black and people of color. During the March on Washington, Lewis also delivered a speech that is still widely regarded today. He also served as an executive director of the Voter Education Project, an organization founded to establish voting rights and voter education. Lewis's lifelong work for equality serve as an everlasting reminder of the importance of uplifting marginalized peoples. Next slide, please. All right, Board of Education staff and our San Luis Rey Advisory Naming Committee recommends that the Board of Education selects one of the committee's top three name recommendations of Dolores Huerta, Pablo Tak, or John Lewis Elementary School for the new name of San Luis Rey Elementary School. Thank you, Matthew and committee members. Um, we have some time for public comments, and I believe there are several people signed up for public comment right now. Okay, we have three for this item. Okay. Shauna Williamson, Victoria Miriani, and Michael Rayal. In that order, please. All right, Shauna, it looks like you're up next. Just to remind you for public comment, we allow three minutes. And as board members, we're not allowed to ask questions or make comments, but we're listening. Oh, just to clarify that, Chair, this is not public comments, not on the agenda. Oh, this is public comments on an item. So we could like question if we needed. Okay. Yeah. So we, if you. we had questions, we could clarify that we needed of the speaker. If, if so, it'd be OK. OK, perfect. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Mike. Good to know. Dr. Begin, the first speaker is not in the room at the moment. I promoted the other two, and I'll continue to look for Ms. Williamson. Okay, we'll go with Victoria Mariani. Thank you. Good evening, board members, students, staff, families, and community members. I am Victoria Mariani, a 21-year employee of the district and currently a fifth grade teacher at San Luis Rey. I stand before you today on the subject of the San Luis Rey name change with a simple but profound request. That request is to delay the formal name change of the school until the remodel of the site is complete and we can have a proper reopening renaming ceremony. My feeling is that it would be premature to change the name of a very old dilapidated school before any or all work is completed on campus. If OUSD did change the name of the school before remodel, it would be demoralizing to students and staff on campus and a very hard sale in energizing them to embrace a new identity under the same old subpar surroundings. Calling the school something new, while it is still sorely in need of repair, would be tantamount to bringing the lipstick on a pig metaphor to life. What would OUSD do in the downtime between now and the remodel being finished? Rip the beautiful San Luis Rey lettering off the front of the school and spray paint in the building? Tear down the sea lion marquee? Or just cover it up with a temporary and unsightly banner? Time and time again, OUSD leadership has been focused on doing what looks good from the outside, not on doing what is right. I ask you board members in all sincerity to think about how you would feel if you were teaching, working at, or attending an old crumbling campus that has been neglected and overlooked for years and leadership rebranded you with a brand new shiny name, <clears throat> Sorry, with the brand new shiny name before any work was done on the school. Would you embrace that change with passion and intensity? 
Or would you view it as a cruel and unusual suffering? Your identity comes from your belief in who you are. It would be a mistake to endeavor to thrust a new name and new identity down SLR's throat without the physical environment and resources needed to truly redefine what our school is and what we stand for. In closing, I implore you to accept the name change as contingent upon the completion of the remodel at SLR so that in the meantime, the actual boots on the ground stakeholders that are on the site can do the hard transformational work that will be needed to truly forge a new identity for the former Garrison San Luis Rey community. Thank, Thank you, you for the time to speak. Thank you, Victoria. All right, Michael Rial, you're up. see him. Michael, if you're speaking, you're muted. So go ahead and unmute. I thought it was after. <sighs> Wasn't there somebody before me? Uh, Victoria just ended, right? Yes, yeah, uh, the other person's not in the room yet, Michael. So go ahead if you're ready. We'll reset oh, the timer. Hey, I have a couple questions, actually, uh, point of order, particularly Madam <laughs> Chair. Yes. Oh, uh, so first off, the item was 6B, correct? That was a public hearing? Yes, it is. So what is this? What, so we didn't, I didn't see that we ever went to public 6C. We haven't got to 6C yet. We're on 6B, the public hearing, then we'll move to 6C. Presentation was before. Is that usually the case? I don't know. In this case, we wanted the public to hear the presentation and the process and the names that are recommended. So everybody was working on the same information. Understood. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I want to thank uh, um, Mr. Blessing for um, willing to or clarifying that we are able to engage. It's just confusing and it's hard to have any kind because there are a lot of point of orders that need to be called out in this. I, I'm glad that we were able to clarify that. So this um, particular item, um, I do have, I mean, I have questions particularly about the community input that was obtained. Um, I, I was not invited to any kind of a community input meeting. I did provide a name that was submitted um, to uh, just the Google form but I didn't have any kind of committee. I, I don't, I, and as I was a member of the last committee that ended up recommending Hacienda Elementary School. And I am, the one thing that I did find, I didn't see any kind of focus groups, any kind of meetings, community meetings, input meetings that occurred. Um, I, again, I said that I, I submitted a name. Um, but at least we engaged in a conversation. It wasn't the best name that ended up coming out of it. I have my faults within that committee and I have accepted them and also apologized for them. Um, and I, I believe that we're moving forward um, with that. But as far as community input for this process, I didn't see really any of that occurring. Um, but if I would say one thing about the names that are being considered, Pablo Talk is the only name that provides any kind of reconciliation or any kind of reparations for what has occurred to the San Luis Rey School site, the neglect that has occurred at San Luis Rey School site, as well as the neglect that's occurred at Garrison School site. And that is my name for recommendation. Um, as far as this is concerned, uh, but um, yeah, I really appreciate any kind of reparations would be greatly appreciated, but that is my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, did, did the other public speaker show up, Shauna?
Still not located. All right. So I'm going to close the public hearing at 7.14 p.m. And now we're moving on to item 6C, consideration to rename San Luis Rey Elementary School. And do we have it? Okay, no, we're good. All right. Do I have a motion? Questions? I'll make the motion. And what is your motion? <laughs> to rename um, San Luis Rey School. Do I need to, at this point, do you want yeah. to identify a name? Yes, that's how it works. Okay, great. Um, haven't had the opportunity to meet, to know, and to even march and share bread with both Dolores Huerta and John Lewis. I know that as we go into the future that they will have many buildings, many physical institutions, even ships named after them and have been named after them. I would like to propose that we um, select the name of Pablo Talk. The criteria- for I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. I would gladly say that. Yeah, as a right. Mission. So I we have a first and a second. Any now now Eleanor, go for it. Sorry. Just trying to stick to order here. I'm sorry, Eleanor. I'm oh no jumped problem. In too excited. No problem. He was super I, excited. It's really exciting that we have someone that um, that's academic, that um, is of the um, Oceanside, Mission San Luis Rey uh, heritage, and who has made such an impact academically as well as um, within the humanities. Thank you. All right, any more comments? I just echo the praise to Dolores Huerta and John Lewis as uh, incredible contributions to humanity and our nation in general. And that um, I too think that the uh, honoring of the indigenous uh, person that's on our list, Pablo Tosk's contribution to uh, not only just, well, his contribution to pre preserving language and the translation of his native language fits in really well with the idea that, you know, language is a big piece of the programming at San Luis Rey right now and that uh, school language piece of their programming. And I just think it's a, it's a perfect fit. It'll be one of a kind and I think it's a beautiful name. All right, I have a first and second. So I'll call for the vote. All in favor of Pablo Talk for the new name for San Luis Rey Elementary? Aye. 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 Right. Looks like it's unanimous. 5-0. Um, I'm going to look over at Julie here. Do, is this where we need to make a motion if, when the renaming will happen? Or would you like to share more info? Um, so this was uh, to rename the school. We can agendize a future item as to when that might be, um, if that's something that the board would like to consider separately we can agendize that for a future meeting, uh, Stacy. This was just the renaming. If you really wanna talk about when, we can put that on a future agenda if you like. Yes, I think we should. Would you like to uh, put that on the next board agenda item, uh, June 22nd? Sure, if it will fit. <laughs> and it then fit. Um, can you also bring to that meeting like a approximate, you know, when the remodel will, be done. Absolutely. Well, actually, you know what, then we will bring it to the uh, July meeting because we will be giving the uh, board an update on all bond projects along with timeline. Um, mm -hmm. So unless you really want to see it sooner, but we will, we are preparing all of that information for the July meeting. Um, so you will see that timeline and where we are in the progression. Um, we've given uh, the board a couple of updates, but we're, we're going to, we're preparing to bring that in July. So that would make sense. Right, well, I think we need that information to make that decision. So we'll wait till July then. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Andy, I don't wanna really put you on the spot, but I guess I am. Um, we do have a timeline. Um, 
I just don't have it handy to be able to say where we're at in that timeline. I wondered if you did. For our project for- um, Ben Lewis Ray, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the modernization. Right, Everything. right now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, we're in the design phase right now. So we're um, still out from construction in um, the different updates that have been given. We've been moving through different portions of the school phase. So we just finished the NPR. And um, we're going to bring that back to the committee. And we have a couple of our board members. We have Trustee Alvarez, and then we have Trustee Joyce on that. And so we'll be bringing that back. And then we just finished talking about what our classrooms are going to look like. And then we'll need to go into deciding what our ed specs are going to be in terms of what, what it's going to look like on the inside of the classroom also. So um, we're still uh, at least 18 months away, but we are in design phase getting closer to construction. But I can have all that in detail for you at the July meeting. Yeah, so will that timeline uh, work, Stacy? Because we actually yes. have a time frame blocked out by months and years, so you can actually see uh, when projected completion is, which is a couple of years out. But it's it's all moving right along. It just doesn't appear to the casual observer that it is because dirt hasn't been moved. But there have been people <laughs> doing a lot of work on this, uh, including our board members, including I believe our uh, public speakers that were on tonight. Um, so it is all moving forward, and the budget is assigned to that. So. I know it Super. seems impossible, but it is all moving forward. Okay, great. We'll look forward to that in July. I also wanted to say thank you to Matthew Jennings, our Director of Communication. This is his last week, right, with us, and he'll be moving on to another school district, unfortunately. But um, thank you for doing this committee on behalf of the whole board. I know it was a lot to take in all those submissions and facilitate. <laughs> The conversations to get to those three names. Thank you. It was a beautiful process, and I am proud to say that Oceanside Unified School District is the only school district in the United States with an elementary school named after Pablo Taco. Cool. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you right. chairs, as well, and every, all yeah. the members of the committee. They put a you. lot of heart into that. Super. Stacy, can I make? I make one comment, Stacy, to staff. Back to the staff is that this issue that was brought up about. The timing of it vis-a-vis -vis new construction, it, I, I would expect in July you would give us your opinion about if there's a phasing or the signage issues or any of those types of things that uh, you've given any thought to about uh, the timeliness of doing it, you know, now or later, uh, what staff's feeling is about all that, that we'd expect to hear that in July too. Yes, you got it. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody on the committee. Um, it was a lot of... Um, there's a lot of work put into it in all the committees that actually went into the actual changing of the name um, for San Luis Rey and all the effort that went into it, all the conversations that happened, um, just being open with one another. It was a process and it was a learning process for, for some of us to, to just um, for myself, even especially just having to hold my tongue at times and, um, and understanding and listening to the passion and, and, and the heart of everybody within this community, the community as a whole, I think it's what drives us to do the things that we do, especially as board members. Um, we look at a, our community and the voices that we have within our community. And within this committee, we did have people that, that wanted to make sure that they were being heard. And I appreciate that. Thank you for, um, for doing that, for just being willing and open to share for the knowledge that uh, many people shared of just the community as a whole. Thank you for that too, because there, there was a lot. We, we learned a lot. We read a lot more books and we probably thought we would have to read just to be for being on the committee. Um, and so just thank you all for your work, for Michael and Alan, just for, for stepping up to the plate, for Matthew, for stepping up and just facilitating these meetings and for being there and for the extra effort and the hard work for making sure that these presentations happened the way that it needed to and, and making it all come together. So thank you again for all your work. All right, thanks. Now we're gonna move on to item seven, personnel. Item seven A, approval of agreement with Keenan and Associates for loss control. I'll turn this over to staff. This would be Dr. McAteer, who I'm sure is unmuting and preparing to speak at this very moment. I'm sure of it.
Or maybe he thought that item would take much longer. <laughs> I am here, sorry about that. All right. All right, so this one is for the uh, risk management that we consult with, with Keenan. And through their work, they have a part-time um, employee that we work with that provides our safety training for staff, investigations, workers' comp claims, risk management policies, and prevention policies and practices that we use in the district. Any questions for staff? If not, I'd move approval of the Keenan agreement. I'll second it. I have a first and a second. Any board members have comments, discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries 5-0. Moving on to 7B, approval of English language authorization for career tech we call education and designated subject teaching credential holders. Sorry, mouthful there. Yeah, these are the variable short-term waivers that we apply for through CTEC to help cover employees that are working on clearing their credentials. We have three employees that are working on their EL authorization, but they are credentialed otherwise. And this provides coverage until those date of completions. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Second. We have a first and second. Any questions? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 7C, approval of expenditure, frontline education digital schools program. The digital schools program is the software program that we use for our time management and personnel management system for all 2000 employees. This provides accurate time accounts for employee pay as well as our personal management system for staffing. Thanks for the explanation. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. First and second, any questions or discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. There we go. He's all happy. All right, <laughs> item 7D <laughs> approval of revised class specification, health clerk. All right, we're changing the health clerk to the health tech with board's action. This has not been updated in, in many years. And since then, we've done an analysis of the work responsibilities and found that this uh, position performs several technical medical procedures and it's important for safe student safety at all of our school sites. And so we're recommending a change uh, both in class specification title and pay for the previous health clerk position. I have a question. I guess we should- I'll make a is, motion to approve. Okay, I'll second. And I have a question. Um, will they re be required to have more um, schooling? Or no, it does not require any recertification or reschooling. They're able to perform these um, positions uh, and the tasks that they do in their existing format. However, the new job description more clearly defines those medical tasks that they're now responsible for. I appreciate well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the work that staff did um, going um, back with the health techs on this issue and sorting out language and uh, compensation and lining them up. Um, it makes makes a lot of sense. We appreciate staff's work on that. Sure. All right, no more questions or discussion. I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Item 7E, adoption of resolution number 40 for the 2021 school year, a reduction of classified positions and hours for the 2021-2022 due to district reorganization. So in recent years, there's been a decrease in the migrant ed population in the district, and the district became aware that the program can be covered by the San Diego County Department of Education. So for um, reorganization and for efficiency, the decision was to go to the county to run that program. 
The impact is one employee in the migrant ed services, an assistant that would be eligible for employment um, by moving into a previous spot that they held in the district. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Any questions or discussions? Not for me. All right. I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries 5 0. Moving right along, we're now into item eight curriculum and instruction. Item 8A is public hearing, and we're opening the public hearing at 7.30 p.m. And this is on the 2019-2020 Local Control and Accountability Plan Update and 2020-2021 Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan Update. This is an information item only. Yes, good evening board. This first item is around the uh, LCAP and LCP. The LCAP and LCP are based on a one-year adjustment based on the pandemic, and it was the end of a three-year cycle. So you will see uh, another item that will be about receiving this information about what we did with our first three-year cycle. Then you'll see two more items, which will be for starting the new three-year cycle in our LCAP. Thank you for the explanation. Do we have any public comments? No, we do not. No. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the public hearing at 7.31 p.m. And we're moving on to the next item, item B, the first reading and review of the 2019-2020 Local Control and Accountability Plan update and the 2020-2021 Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan update. Yeah, so as I explained before, this is the closing of the three-year cycle and an update on how we spent the first uh, part of our money through the LCP. And this will be returned to you for a vote on, on June 22nd. Okay, do we need to take any questions or do I need, I'm looking at Dr. Vitale. We'll take any questions if there are any, uh, but we do not need to vote on this item. This is for information only. We'll bring it back to June 22nd for a vote. Any board members have a question? All right. I don't have any. All right. So we are moving on to item, I have like duplicates on my thing. Item D, first reading and review. We just did that, right? Item 8C, um, Stacy will begin. This is the public hearing. I know it's confusing, but this is for the 21-22 local control okay. accountability plan. So we'll go there first. All right, so public hearing is opening at, now I don't have a time here, 7.32 p.m. for the 2021-2022 Local Control Accountability Plan. Thank you, good evening board. We have a short, we have a presentation for you about our Local Control and uh, Accountability Plan and also a short update on the LCP. Next slide, please. So our learning continuance and attendance plan was a one-year replacement for our LCAP based in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This was around our funding to support education and health needs during the pandemic. It identified specific actions to respond to COVID-19 and had a summary of actions. Some of the things that we used our LCP funding on and were focused on were our physical plant enhancements, including our hand washing, care tents, and health equipment, PPE, we also had additional staff training, distance learning supports, and an attendance and engagement monitoring. So all of these things were outlined in the spring of 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we also will be telling you about how we ended our three-year cycle for the, L the LCAP. Next slide, please. I'd like to remind everyone that we did have some recommendations from 1920. So while we do have a three-year plan, that we do annually review the plan, make suggestions, and see what would be the best um, path forward. So at the end of the planning session for the 1920, 
there was a desire that if additional funding became available, the LCAP committee recommended full-time elementary assistant principals be put in place, that it would be funded through a supplemental and concentration, and that full-time elementary school counselors would be put in place based again on student needs and Title I funding. Next slide, please. We have a LCAP committee, uh, which is comprised from members of the Board of Education, parents and guardians, CSEA representatives, ODA representatives, site administrators, and district staff who work collaboratively to review data, uh, examine actions, and make recommendations for improvements in our LCAP. Next slide, please. As part of this work, we developed an LCAP survey and we had this survey launched to the community. We had over 1500 elementary students responded to the survey about what people felt were priorities for our district and what they felt would be a enhancement of our current programming. We had uh, four, uh, 14, 1,480 second, secondary students responded, more than that, 2,500 families responded and 480 uh, staff responded, more in each group. Next slide, please. Out of the survey, we had key findings. These included intervention teachers and tutoring was a priority, that there was a need for a variety of learning opportunities for students, including visual and performing arts, a desire for updated curriculums, professional learning opportunities for all of our staff, the idea that we need to be attentive to counseling and social emotional learning and the need for technology tools. Next slide. So this brings us to the start of our 2021-2022 LCAP, which again starts a three-year cycle of our LCAP. Next slide, please. As a part of our work on the committee, there was a, mo a slight modification for our three goals. The first one being that all students will graduate prepared for college and or career. Goal two, that we have safe and positive learning environments. And goal three, meaningful family and community engagement. Next slide, please. Under each goal, we have specific actions that are put into place in order to meet these goals. These are in three different levels, including providing base services, supplemental services, ensuring that we have the engagement opportunities that we need, and that we have additional supports for those students who are struggling or have specific needs. Next slide, please. So when we look at goal one, academic achievement, we have our first action, which focuses on our classroom teachers, our core services. And if you will see in action on this slide, action 1.1 and action point 1.2, talk about the key services that we provide. Our LCAP committee was very clear that they wanted us to continue with many of the same things that we have had in place, that we felt that there was a good response. We are seeing growth in student achievement and a reduction in uh, indicators that would concern us about uh, student performance. If you see on this slide, there is a green section which says elementary assistant principals. That's in green. We did have it, but there is going to be a recommendation uh, around the elementary assistant principals coming forward. Next slide, please. We also wanted to make sure that we were thinking about our common assessments, which is the progress monitoring that we talked about earlier in the COVID presentation, which is ensuring that we continue to fund our iReady and STAR, which you see is in the blue font, which will be our new progress monitoring tool for our high school that is more aligned to the high school needs and desires for a progress monitoring tool. This includes the allocations as well for our Title I to the sites and how we use Title I funds centrally. Next slide, please. In goal two, again, we have three specific action items that include the learning environment, which is how we fund our, uh, I'm sorry, could you go back one? Thank you. Which uh, provide our maintenance and operations and custodians, our crisis response and coordination, supporting our social emotional learning, attendance, equity, our homeless support, and also social emotional needs. And if you see at the bottom of this slide, 
elementary councils, counselors are in light blue there, because again, we'll be looking at that enhancement for the coming year. Next slide. Goal three is around family and community engagement. And this is what we want to be focusing on as to ensure that our families have input on decisions, meaningful input, that, that we would provide focus groups, committees, surveys to hear the needs of our families. We wanna make sure that we have engagement activities for families to participate meaningfully, both in educational opportunities and in decision-making. We also wanna make sure that we continue to offer bilingual services and our family engagement, TOSA, and our school community advisors. Next slide, please. So again, we had those recommendations for the full-time elementary assistant principal and the full-time elementary school counselors from 19, 2019 to 2020. Next slide. So as we looked at our funding, the first thing that we wanted to make sure is that we continue with the services that were outlined in the 2021 LCAP. And one of the things that we knew upon study of our community was that our military connected families who are served by our K-8 schools were in need of more support for counseling in SEL. So what we have examined is that we would provide a full-time middle school counselor for each of our K-8 schools on the base that would be funded through the general fund. These middle school counselors would provide supports to our middle school students and also supports to our elementary students on the base. The recommendation was also made for full-time elementary school counselors for each elementary school. The committee found that having the elementary school counselors split between two sites at times uh, meant that there was a delay of being able to approach the services in a timely manner and also build a cohesive culture. So in looking at our Title I funding, we, we know that we are able to fund full-time elementary school counselors with our Title I funds. The next recommendation was full-time assistant principals for each elementary school and K-8 school. This again was around building a cohesive culture, ensuring that the services for our students with special needs, our homeless population, and students who have 504 plans and attendance, and we were able to do that connectedness and supports that will be targeted to all students. The other thing that we were looking at is ensuring that we have English intervention, English language learner intervention teachers at each comprehensive high school to address the needs of students, both in the designated and integrated ELD program. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the recommendations that for enhancements uh, by the committee. Uh, we are eager to hear any questions and discuss the options that we have around these enhancements to our LCAP. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levy, for the presentation. Do we have any public comments? Not on this item. Okay. Board, staff discussion, any questions? Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the uh, a lot of the actions in the LCAP say that these efforts, this is like the last statement, these efforts of the resources, the efforts of these resources will be principally directed towards foster youth, homeless youth, English learners, low income students and students with disabilities. Um, I guess I just uh, I just worry because a lot of those are um, they don't feel as as defined, and I don't know if that like how will we define how those resources get allocated specifically with those student populations. I'm just worried about directing direct services to students. So um, I guess in the next presentation that we have, it'd be good to hear a little bit more about the process about how those get directly allocated. And those go under things like CTE, professional learning, alt ed, career and college support, safety, staffing, and SROs. So it's 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 a pretty broad statement. I don't know if that's um, typical practice. 
It is, and I can um, share that. So one of the things that the that we have always been cognitive of, especially like we've talked about our summer school programming, is that our the students that were outlined um, as the students who are at Promise receive the first opportunities to uh, participate in all of these um, services. That we make sure that we do a proactive outreach to the students and families so that they are aware of it and that they have the priority and the opportunity to participate in the services. So what that is one part of it. The other part of it is it's a statement around the fact that we have about 62% of our students uh, fall into one of the at promise um, uh, categories. So as such, when we launch the services into our school sites, 62% of our students who would participate in them would be defined as the at promise students. So those are some of the targets. When we look at a neighboring district who might be below a 55% of the students being at promise, they specifically have to in their LCAP outline specific additional services that are only allowed for the students who are at promise. But in our district, once you reach over the 55% of students who are at promise, you can then offer those more widely knowing that you will be improving the circumstances for all your students. I did not know there was a distinction there. That's very interesting. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so with, sorry, Dr. Begin, was I interrupting you? So with that in mind, um, knowing that our school sites do vary so widely, so you said 62% is about the average. I know that we have um, at least, and I have it at hand because I knew I would forget it. So. We have four school sites where over 90% of the students are socioeconomically disadvantaged. We have an additional four that have students um, at 80% or above, uh, 80 to 90% are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So I, I love that we're, you know, it's clear we're investing. It looks like it's about 1.2 million in new spending on the counselors and APs if we were to go full at all the, all the sites all together. Um, what I would ask is uh, for our board to, to consider uh, including another uh, or including another addition to this plan that takes community schools model into consideration. Um, it's a minimal investment comparatively to the total investment we're doing. It, I, would, I would ask that we target three to four sites, preferably the ones that are the most impacted. We knew the students at those sites face um, additional barriers and, and the concentration of students that, that face those barriers at those sites is really high. Um, we know that that's a whole child approach looking at providing uh, the supports that are outside the eight to three school timeline. Um, I, would, I would ideally love us to commit to do a three-year trial to see if we can really disrupt the predictability in outcomes that come with our different school sites that are differently impacted by poverty. Um, this would be a coordinator of those services. So the actual investment would be a coordinator of services at each of those sites. So three to four sites, depending on what the board sees fit. Um, they would be bilingual. They would help us with the, with the counting of the unduplicated pupil count, which we really, we really struggled with over the past year. And it would specifically address goal three with a specific investment where I don't see a, a lot of investment in goal three on our uh, one, two, three goals, which is getting our families and communities to see our schools as the hub of our communities. Um, it would improve communication and it would really uh, invest those uh, communities to see that their schools are, are a big piece of, of their future. So. Um, the three-year com commitment would be huge. I think it's exciting, um, Eric, because the governor's budget had some money. Like they have been talking, we will know more when the governor's budget is approved, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's, that's a part I didn't even bring up. So the governor put forward 3 billion and the legislature had 2 billion. So we know there's money coming in this budget. So if we give direction today, we can get started on this this year and have a slow roll in for the next six months collect information from the school sites, have those coordinators in place and ready to have the programs up and running by second semester. I think that doesn't place too much undue burden and those coordinators, that would be their only job, would be to coordinate those services. 
for families at those sites that are most impacted. This is like really hitting the equity piece. I spent uh, last week with the California Teachers Association State Council and the largest amount of money mentioned for um, community schools was $1 billion one-time funding. Um, I don't know how much would be allocated for Oceanside in terms of that. I know Mike Levin spoke earlier about us receiving funds, but um, my concern is the sustainability of, of this program, the duplication of services of this program. One of the things that I, that I felt we all observed was that not only the city, but the county were duplicating and the district were duplicating many of the services. As an example, the distribution of food, um, transportation. And I think we really need to sit down and analyze how are we going to set this up. Most of those schools are near the Vista um, clinic. And then there's true care that's close by. How do we coordinate services so that it's, it is sustainable and it is um, succinct and people really do take advantage of it in a positive way. Super. Julie, I think you, you're getting some direction here to start looking into some things <laughs> around community schools. So let me ask no. for some clarification. Um, well, I, okay. Can I, can of course. I say something? I think we, we really need to look at what the definition of community schools is before we start giving direction. And maybe this is some of the school districts that have community schools. Um, um, if, if we're gonna do this, we need to be successful. And the, a three-year cycle and suddenly we realize, oh, what's the way to go? Do you know how damaging that is to our brand as, as a school district if it's not successful? Um, we've only to look at down south, the things they're doing. So I think maybe we should really talk to folks who, who've um, been involved with community schools whether it's Keisha Borden or um, Ramon Espinal. I think the board members, as board members, we need to do that. Okay, I'm well, not I wanna it. I'm not keep for us it. to the LCAP, you guys, just for what we're working on here. So Julie, do you need any I have a couple questions. So um, Eric, are you, uh, are you talking about that? Um, at this juncture because you believe it can be inserted into the LCAP and then the funding that we can use can either come from the federal monies that are being allocated for community schools or the state money. Is that why you specifically brought it up here because you believe it can be written in to the LCAP? Is that is that what you're saying? Correct, I think it, it could be added to the third goal of the LCAP that's, that supports family and community engagement. Okay, and then another clarification. Um, so the coordinators that you mentioned, and thank you for mentioning that there would be um, additional staff to do this work, because as you know, uh, from the research that you've done and from the research that we've done so far, um, that this is very um, specific work that we would definitely need dedicated staff to. So what I wonder is, do you know of a district where that job description exists as we do not have, uh, so can you give me one or two or however many districts you have that have that? Yes, I have, I have a list I can bring forward. Oh, to okay. I, I was thinking now, but you can give it to me later. So then Stacy, what I would need to understand is um, because this coordinator that would need to do the work, if the board uh, wants this put into the LCAP and then us to associate uh, funding with it from the COVID dollars that are going to come from the state and or the Fed specifically for community schools. And we should know more on June 15th. Um, uh, meanwhile, I can we can get that information. We can research those positions. Uh, what I'm trying to get to for clarity, Eric, is if, if, if you're asking the other board members to add this to LCAP, I'm thinking that's what you need to get direction from them on. And then, then I'm going to, I heard coordinator and I heard slow roll, both of those things I appreciate. So dedicated staff that would do this work. 
and a slow roll into it uh, because I know that that is a pretty big lift. As Eleanor stated, we would wanna be um, successful in this work because fundamentally you're looking at disrupting outcomes, which we would absolutely wanna be successful in doing. So I think I have that part clear. Um, I think that you need to get consensus from your board members to, um, to write that into the LCAP, right? Well, I'm looking over at Raquel. We both sat on the LCAP committee and this did not necessarily this term or concept because like Eleanor said, I think there's some confusion. What is a community school? What is that concept? Um, it didn't come up at LCAP. Raquel, do you recall it coming up? It didn't come up during LCAP, but I know that I've been looking into it some more even after LCAP and, and because I did um, go thoroughly through the LCAP and um, it is something because we look at the, the needs and the, the success that we want to have for our students. So when we're looking at success and what it means in those, in, in those communities, we need to, again, bring programs and things like that that are going to actually help them and grow them to, to be successful. So whatever that support may be, and if we're going to be able to get funding and we can write into the LCAP, then I suggest that we look at it now as thoroughly as we possibly can and, and not say that, oh, it's something that we're not gonna look at or just kind of blow it off. I mean, we're obviously here for our students. We want to be um, as supportive as we possibly can. And to also know that the, the, there are particular schools in our community that we just don't reach a certain way, no matter, even through the things that we're reaching out through, through LCAP, there are students that we miss and and why do we miss them? And so if this is gonna be one of those resources that we can use to help the students, then I, I'm all for it. I mean, we've, I've been in different schools with just my kid that, you know, the students have been missed. And even though they're even just my own personal, you know, is that the services aren't offered to everybody the way that they should. And so they're lost and they're skipped and they're missed and not, not purposely, but if there's something, there's a secondary program or a secondary, um, person looking differently at, at the students needs, then maybe we can catch them and, and not have the, the gap that we have currently. Mercedes, do you have some thoughts about the right placement, whether it's uh, LCAP or whether it's COVID dollars and also um, just your knowledge on the subject matter? And, you know, Eric, we, uh, well, all of you, we, we hear definitely what you're asking we would, um, it feels really fast, but it's not that we haven't moved fast on things before. Um, Mercedes, say something. Yes, uh, so thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. When we do look at goal three, um, that would be a great spot to put it. Um, you know, we can also look at our school community advisors who are a great resource and we're looking at how we can uh, make sure that we're leveraging them as much as possible. So in our research around community schools, some things that emerge. One of them is that a community school needs to be unique to each school and needs to be developed in partnership with our families and respond to them. So part of that, as you're looking at the research, I'm sorry, there was a small bug. Um, in looking at the research around this, uh, one of the things that we know is that coordinator, one of the things that they would be looking at, but even before you have the coordinator, is what does that school need the coordinator to do? So a couple of the key parts is the coordinator and community outreach and collaboration at the specific school site to know what the local needs are and also what the local opportunities are. Um, as uh, Ms. Evans shared, uh, we have Vista Community Clinic, which is a partner with us. We have our Palomar Family Counseling. We have um, other uh, TC, other uh, Pass AmeriCorps. There's a lot of things um, in our neighborhood that we want to be making sure that we leverage. So one thing that we could do, again, as I was saying, this is a launching of a new three-year plan. We could set a um, action item around community schools with year one being an investigation year and a discovery year where we would look at the data around our schools to look at which schools might be the best fit for this, work on a work group plan moving forward. And then that way, that would be just a, like maybe a one year or half year process to make sure that we really do it well, that we follow the spirit, which is not that we are doing it for or to the school, but that the school and it, the idea of the community builds the program. And so that takes time because we want to be able to make sure we're, we're not using just what we think about what a community needs, but we really listen and engage them. 
So we could put a line of the action in for the first year of an exploratory, um, really building our knowledge, identifying those potential pilot schools second year, um, using what we learned, getting those pilot schools in place, evaluate the data, and then third year and moving forward. It would still allow us to leverage both supplemental and concentration dollars to do it, Title I and any COVID or special um, targeted money that the governor or legislature puts forward. This would allow us to make sure that we put forward a plan that is well thought out, it's measured and moves forward in a systematic way to really meet the needs and again, is emerging as a more of a grassroots from the community as well. That's, that sounds like a plan to me that follows the LCAP process. It might not be fast enough for Eric. I, I, the, the reason I asked for, the reason I asked for speed and the six, six months is different than a year from maybe because six months means we have the coordinators meeting with the community this year and developing that information this year. And we could even start because community schools is not like a stamp you put on a school. It's a building of services around the community and, and keeping them in place over the long term. So it's not like it's a, it's not like we all of a sudden have, you know, the community school. This is a building process that if we commit to it now by having those people at those sites, they're the ones that will work with the community to find those, to find and identify the exact things that the community itself needs. The reason I'm asking for speed is because this budget uh, is an incredible investment in our schools. Our, you know, California has never seen a, a school budget like this. So the time to do big things is this year because the time is now with the budget. So I'm asking that, you know, while we're looking at adding lots of personnel, let's add personnel that are going to develop individualized community-based programs. That's, that's why I asked for speed because it, it, it is a timely matter. Okay, we don't have to spend, we're getting all this money, allegedly. I wanna see it, you know, but we don't have to like spend it right now. There's a timeline associated with the funds that we receive from different entities. So even though, you know, I know just human nature when you're getting exposed to a, you know, a sum of money, like supposedly the government is sending us, you want to spend it, you want to do it, you know, you're afraid, you know, like it, historically it's been, if you don't spend it within a year, you got to give it back. Well, my understanding and what I learned at state council was that no, you know, we want to really analyze what we're going to do with this money. We have a timeline. We don't have to quote, spend it all at once. And if not within a, a certain, within the year, give it back. You know, we can do it in a timely fashion and consequently do it right. So it sounds like Julie, you have consensus. That, that we so want to see it in the LCAP. Uh, to see it in the LCAP. And so, um, Eric, the timing that you're expressing makes sense if we're able to uh, get the job description and hire the coordinator. So basically, they would do, be doing all of the work under the supervision, supervision of uh, TBD. Um, OK, so then, Stacy, is the direction to write this into the LCAP and um, work on those coordinator job descriptions. I don't, I won't. Will this be run endeavor. by the LCAP committee? Uh, Mercedes is there. I don't think there's any plans to go back to the, okay. uh, to the LCAP committee. Remember the LCAP committee makes recommendations to the board of education and then ultimately the board uh, approves the LCAP. Okay. All right, well. And this, is, this, is a, this is a big, uh, this is a big drop in here at the last second and it's our prerogative to do it. And as Stacy's identified, it looks like there's a consensus on the board to do this. I haven't heard a dollar number amount, it's all new money. So I guess that's not an issue, but it's a big, uh, big jump. Um, and I'm, um, I'm cautiously in supportive of this. I, would, I would, would love to have workshopped this last year at our Gal Goals workshop uh, kind of thoroughly and get some understandings of this stuff and know what schools we're talking about by this point in time and stuff like that. And I would, I was going to earlier suggest maybe we do that at our workshop at the end of June, but I see that that's not going to make much sense. But at least maybe you can 
flesh it out a little bit more for me um, at, at our workshop in June so um, I can understand it better. But um, I see there's, I, I know that the goal is a good one. I don't disagree with the goal at all. And I'm, I'm timing as timing as, as, a, as an old staffer, I'm, um, I'm always uh, in, the, in, the, in the suit with a staff that says, I don't have enough time to do this stuff. But as a board member, I can just say, you got to do it, you know. So you have your consensus. Oh. We appreciate the empathy, Mike. Um, Stacy, for timing, um, you know, I'm just looking at the calendar. I don't want to make false promises. So um, the coordinator position will work on it and we'll bring it back as soon as we can. I don't know that I can do that by June 22nd, definitely by July. And either at the June 22nd or July meeting, we need to, you know, we would like to just share more information about what it means to have a community school. And again, I will say thank you for, um, uh, you know, putting that staff dedication to it because we, we, we wouldn't be able to do this lift with our current staff, but with some increases in staffing and some uh, potential reorganization of how we do our work, I, I, think that, I think that we could do this. So we'll endeavor by June 22nd, uh, no later than July 20th, okay, for the jobs. All right, sounds good. I did have one question, Dr. Levy. Um, when we looked at the LCAP recommendations for the elementary school counselor and the um, vice principals, assistant principals at the elementaries, is Surfside Academy involved in any of that or are they a complete separate entity? Um, they are currently under a separate, they already have a assistant principal that serves the entire um, school and that was put in place this year um, in response to the increased enrollment that they had had. Um, so they have uh, that and they also have counselors at their school site, where if you compare okay. it, it's a smaller school site than some of our K-8s who do not have those supports currently. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that question. Sure thing. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Because I'm about to close the public hearing. My only other question is uh, for the principals and, and counselors, uh, they are enrollment, that it says considerations of enrollment and concentration uh, are both considered. I understand that that could be very difficult, but it, it would be helpful, I think, in the, in the next meeting to have an, uh, an idea of how that lays out, like if the funding isn't there for 100% of right. all the sites, it would be nice to know what our triage, triage I, I don't know, a better way to say it, probably a better way to say it than triage, but what our list looks like, that would be nice. Thank you. All right, no further questions. I'm gonna close the public hearing at 8.07 p.m. And we're moving on to item D, the first reading and review of the 2021-2022 Local Control Accountability Plan. So uh, board, that is what we just discussed. Uh, we've received uh, direction during the, the um, hearing and we will uh, uh, update that and there will be budget numbers attached to it and it will be brought back on June 22nd for a vote um, for adoption along with our budget. All right, thank you, Dr. Good. Levy. Thank you. All right, the next item, item E. Oh, my son's gonna be happy about this. Approval of new secondary start times for the 2021-2022 school year. Yes, good evening. I'd like to have uh, Dr. Richard Lawrence uh, walk you through uh, this proposal. Dr. Lawrence? Yes, good evening, um, Board President, Dr. Begin, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Vitali, Executive Cabinet members, staff and families. This evening, I'm presenting to you information for your consideration regarding the proposed start times for the secondary schools for the 21-22 school year. Next slide, please. The move for later start times for secondary schools was created out of research, which found that adolescents experience a later shift in sleep cycles during puberty and later wake times can improve academic functioning. This research prompted the draft and approval of Senate Bill 328, which was signed into law on October 13, 2019. Under the new law, middle schools can start no earlier than 8 a.m., high schools can start no earlier than 8.30 a.m. This is to, be, was to be, is to be implemented by July 1st of 2022. Next slide, please. The implementation of Senate Bill 328 brings both opportunities and challenges. 
those opportunities being a level of consistency in our start time since hybrid and virtual learning occurred in our, our 1920 and 2021 school years. Secondly, early academic interventions, meaning that space which was once period one at the high school level is a viable option for zero period intervention and enrichment options for students. Next option is in the survey during the pandemic, students and parents requested for later start times, which would continue to honor their voice and their requests for later start times for the secondary students. And then implementing this change for the fall allows for us to engage in consistent learning times without having to make two shifts being the fall of 2021 and then the fall of 2022. The schedule doesn't impact or create a need to shift the times at the elementary school level. The potential changes, challenges that may occur with a shift to later start times would be student yeah. athletes having later practice times, having to leave earlier. This will be the case eventually for all high school students. This may be mitigated because all high schools will have to move to a later start time, which may not be as great as initially thought of. This wow. creates multiple schedules for families to adapt to, which is a current challenge for families. And students may have to make quick turnaround to complete wow. homework and then get to their part-time jobs. Um, this is the next slide. Oh. Please. The process that was employed for this exploration in, in exploring the option for moving the start time for the fall, discussions were held with site leaders, teachers, and stakeholder groups. We also collaborated with transportation, nutrition services, and other departments to ensure whether there would be consistency of services, and we thought of ways to maximize the new start and end times for students. Next slide, please. Over the last two years, our students, teachers, staff, and families have had to engage in multiple shifts, pivots, and changes to the start times. What is being proposed would align us back on the path of consistency, but with options for, of support for our students to be, be there sooner for our students to man, in this mandate in order to support our efforts to maximize our reach in supporting our secondary students and families. Next slide, please. I would like to invite back up Dr. Lovey with the staff's recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. At this time, we'd like to recommend that the OUSD Board of Education approve start times and compliance at SB 328. That middle schools begin at eight o'clock in the morning and high schools will begin at 8.30 a.m. I will make that motion. I'll second it. <laughs> I can't wait to second it. Sorry, you got it. You got that one. <laughs> Any questions? Discussion, board members? All right. Thanks for the presentation. I'll, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. I mean, I've got a blackout at my house, folks. So that's why my screen is all dark. I'm still live though with you. I'll stay with you as long as I can. Hope we get power back. It's the neighborhood. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Right. Hang in there. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Next item F, approval of new course outline for El Camino High School Explorations and Data Science. And the staff that wants to talk about this. Yes, Mercedes will come on. She unmuted there. She Yes, this is, uh, excuse me, this is again, a uh, adoption of a new course of study for our schools. It has gone through the uh, proper channels and will be, um, sorry, one second. Uh, thank you. So this is our, uh, gone through our, uh, School ex, uh, Explorations in Data Science. It's a pre-collegiate course and it has gone through our curriculum study committee and we recommend approvals to allow for this to be offered to our students in the following school year. I'll make a motion to approve. All right, I got a first and a second. Any questions? Yes, 
how does this uh, affect classes like calculus or will it cancel out calculus or? It is an elective course that would be in addition and students could take it in addition to a calculus course or other higher level math. All right, with no further discussion, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. All in favor of this new course, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to item G, approval of new course outline for Oceanside High School, introductions to careers in education. Yes, this item and the following item are for our CTE pathways to ensure that we have a course sequence of both the introductory course and the follow-up course. So this is a new course to ensure that we have the proper introductory course for careers in education and a revision to the second course as well so that our students can have their pathways approved. This is a two-year course. It's actually a one-year course and then it is the, the next item will be the uh, second year course. All right, I'll make a motion to yes. approve. A second. I'll second. All right. Sorry, Eleanor. Didn't mean to cut you off. You have more questions? Is, is there unmute. a curriculum already with this? My concern is um, from what was what I read, it was seen that students were spending a heck of a lot of time out of the classroom, observing, visiting schools, and I understand all that, but I'm wondering if would it be more effective? You no know, teachers are supposed to be Renaissance. If they could spend that time in terms of um, studying and focusing on their A through G classes so that they can go on into a, a four, four year university or, or a two year university. And, it, and then when it, there's also, I'm sorry, there's also the statement made that um, this ties in with Miracosa's. Um, education program and it ties in with um i guess san marcos or any other teachers uh college i see a huge redundancy in terms of the services we're offering i mean like i know i wanted to be a teacher from the time i was in first grade and my teacher actually in first grade was a, a junior at from Fisk University because you know the, the school had been burnt down and my parents went out and built a, bought a chicken shack and hired this young lady. But the bottom line is, are we using our resources the most effective way? A two-year course and just you know observing and being, I guess, sort of an instructional aid. How effective is that going to be for the student in the long run? Thank you, Ms. Evans. This is actually an A through G approved course. So it's an elective credit for students. So they actually get an opportunity to earn this. So it might be an, an alternative, let's say, um, to, uh, I don't know, a wood shop or something like this. And so what this does is the observation portion, which you are correct, it is in this description. The, the description says that it is for six weeks in the spring semester. So it is a limited in scope when the students would be able to go. So for example, the students would go to Laurel or Mission School and be able to observe elementary students and see what the work of a teacher is. Um, this has been known of a great way. A lot of um, districts are really focusing on this because we know we have a teacher shortage uh, looming. We have fewer people entering the profession than we have leaving the profession. And so this course allows students to think early on, is this something I want to do? And oftentimes people think, well, you're in school, you should know what teachers do. But um, I know we have many teachers on our board. There's quite a bit that happens uh, before and after in preparation for instruction and being able to understand assessments. So this is an introductory course. The second one again is the second part of it so that students can put their eye towards a bachelor's degree in um, education and earning a credential ultimately. Well, it also helps them with their ECE units to, to work in preschools and stuff while they're working through their education. Okay, that's my next question. But um, the second semester or the second year, how long would that be? 
I'll have to check that one. I did look up the first okay. one. So I believe it's six weeks both times. Uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Lawrence, do you know how many for the course that's in the next item, how long their observation opportunities are? It is the same amount of time. It is the same six weeks in the second week. Okay. All right. There is a very esoteric, um, I guess, certificate of credential TA teacher assistant. And I know because as a um, sophomore, actually a freshman, second semester freshman, I was able to get a job at Crawford High School as a TA teaching assistant. And I'm wondering um, with this program, going in and leaving high school and going, um, going to a college, a four-year university, especially in, in this area, geographically, can um, that credential be revised? The age requirement is 18 as opposed to 21. I don't know if, I don't know of anyone who, who utilizes it. And I don't know if, if the legislature has done away with it, but um, it's definitely, I mean, you're making the same amount of money as a teacher assistant, which means that, you know, you're in college, you have expenses, you know, et cetera. And that money goes a long way in terms of that. So oh, instead sorry. of being a minimum wage instructional aid, you know, you're making the same, you're making double that. All right. I'm just, I'm just saying. All right, um, I'm gonna call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to the next item, which is related, approval of revision to existing course outline for Oceanside High School careers in education. So this is year two of the same program. Okay, I'll make a motion to um, support that. I'll second. Second. I just say we met with some of the kids at the CTE Expo that are doing this program that had been reading digitally to their schools and their elementary schools, and they were really passionate about it. They were awesome and excited about being educators. So come back to us. Come teach here in Oceanside. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. All right. I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion. Motion carries 5-0. I am, it's 8-21. I'm going to take we're going to take a 10 minute break because we have been going since four o'clock. So 10 minute break. It is 821. We will, we will come back at 831. Is that okay, board members? Okay. Yep.
I'm here, Stacey. Great, thanks. All yeah. right, time's up. All right. Everyone is circling back. Thanks for the 10 minute break. All right, just waiting for Raquel and Eleanor. Here they go. All right. So we're going to start off after the break with item nine, student services, 9A. Addendum to the 2021 California Healthy Kids Survey, Gender Identity and Sexual Orientation, Orient, I'm sorry, Oriented Based Harassment Module. Stop. Hi, Dr. Sparks. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this um, addition to our California Healthy Kids Survey. Um, we aim to foster safe, inclusive, and supportive environments for learning and belonging and OUSD for all students. And so it's crucial that we understand on a regular basis what the student experience entails and what barriers exist to students showing up to school physically, emotionally, and socially and thriving while they're here learning. <clears throat> One way we can do this is to use the California Healthy Kids Survey or as we call it, CHICS, to be administered in grades five, seven, nine, and 11, which we do this annually to gather data regarding student experience and perspective by adding a short module to the survey. What we know is that LGBTQ youth and those perceived as LGBTQ are at an increased risk of being bullied and studies show that they sometimes avoid going to school because of safety concerns. Further bullying puts youth at increased risk for a variety of unhealthy behaviors and potentially harmful outcomes. The gender identity and sexual orientation based harassment chicks module, California Healthy Kids survey module assesses students' perceptions of harassment experiences on school campus related to gender identity and sexual orientation, specifically those students who identify as or are perceived to be LGBTQ. The items on this module would include questions around bullying frequency, negative attitudes and language expressed by peers and school staff, pro-bullying attitudes, peer and staff intervening behaviors, willingness to seek help, and availability of school-based prevention and intervention supports. So the recommendation is that we add this module, which is a short um, uh, nine to 12 question module to the end of our California Healthy Kids Survey to be administered um, in the following year as it's administered each year during the spring administration. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any questions for staff discussion? No. Thank no. you for bringing this forward. The information I think could be incredibly helpful and the better picture we can paint of our student experience, especially those that we know face certain challenges, then the better we can serve them. So thank you. Well put, Eric. All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Item 9B, ratification of agreements for summer enrichment programs for the 2021 school year. Thank you, board. This is to approve uh, the after-school enrichment programs that will be done through our community partners who have been providing our uh, secondary learning centers and EEP programs for the summer. So they will be offered to those students that we talked about earlier in the board meeting who will be attending summer programming. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Any questions, discussion? No. All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving along to item 11 in business, 11A. I'm gonna open another public hearing tonight. It is, I'm gonna open the hearing at 8.37 PM for the proposed 2021-2022 preliminary budget adoption. 
Good evening, Dr. Begin, members of the board, Dr. Vitale and Cabinet. California Education Code requires that the Board of Education adopt a budget for the fiscal year 2021 through 2022 by June 30th of 2021. Tonight, Tim Golden, our Director of Fiscal Services, will present our first reading of the proposed preliminary budget for the fiscal year 2021-2022, presented for the first reading. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Vitale. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Uh, as we normally do, we'll go through our first reading here of the preliminary adopted budget. And here is the outline of the items that we'll be going through. Uh, um, Mr. Golden, can yes. I make a request that you go a little bit slower since it is after 8.30? And um, I just for my other board members, can you go through this not as fast as your normal speed? You got it. Absolutely. Can All right. Do. Thank you. All right, so um, here is our outline that we normally look at um, for our presentation. So we'll cover these topics uh, as we go through uh, the presentation here. Next slide, please. On uh, this slide, we're just gonna do a little bit of the economic background. Uh, as many of you know, the state budget was last year projected to see huge cuts and they were forecasting uh, large deficits. Um, but as we now know, those uh, projections did not come to fruition. And so we do have a surplus in the state's budget. And um, with that came a lot of different things. So uh, both the governor and the legislature are currently still working towards uh, ironing out some of those details. But just as economic background here, that the state had much more revenues come in than they were anticipating with uh, the pandemic. Next slide, please. Looking at um, what the money that came in with the state is much higher than what we were anticipating. And so with that, uh, the state has to make a deposit into the rainy day fund or the Public School System Stabilization Account, PSSSA. Um, and why this is important is uh, in, in the prior year, we were looking at <clears throat> having to tap into those funds, those reserve funds. Um, and we ended up not having to tap into those funds. And now that we have a larger revenues, another deposit into those reserves um, could trigger a cap on school district unrestricted reserves in the 22-23 year, which is not the upcoming year, but that would be the following year. Um, and I'm sure as, as we do more presentations, we'll get into more details about what that might look like and how or if it will impact our district. But um, this would be something that is new and has not uh, ever been triggered. So um, we'll keep an eye on that item. The uh, state legislature, just as a, a reminder with timelines, uh, the legislature has to give the governor their proposal by June 15th. Uh, as you may remember, the governor had to propose his budget by May 15th uh, so that the legislature has about a month to, to craft their response. And so in the coming days here, we should be seeing the formal um, budget proposal from the legislature side. And uh, then the governor has until July 1st to, to sign that budget into, um, into a budget act. And just as a, a reminder here, as, as everyone may be well aware, that we're often dealing with trying to build a budget, um, you know, surrounded by our LCAP, but then also surrounded by all the assumptions of not actually having a state budget signed into place. So just emphasizing that we're crafting our budget right now based on what the assumptions currently are since we don't have anything that is concrete. And once we do have that concrete state budget, we'll then make adjustments and try to provide um, the most up-to-date information for uh, our, our board and our staff. Um, the final element here is the state's GAN limit. Um, this is a spending limit that was set back, I believe, in it might have been the 80s, it might have actually been late 70s, but um, the GAN limit basically states that there is a spending limit at the state level, and if they exceed that state um, spending limit, the GAN limit, in, um, in consecutive years, then there would be a refund to both taxpayers as well as potentially schools. 
And so we don't know how much or what the distribution might look like, but we're looking that um, it's anticipated that schools are expecting some funds in the future. We don't think it's going to be 21, 22 in the upcoming year, but we think it might be in 22, 23. Um, so as more information comes out about that element, we'll then um, be sure to report that during our reports to the board. We don't know if that will go through LCFF. Um, it wouldn't go through LCFF, but it could be potentially based on the allocation might be based on LCFF. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And here on this slide, I just wanted to kind of give a rough uh, um, look at what each element is for uh, the governor's stance as well as the legislature's and where they might have some agreement. And you'll see here um, the, the LCFF COLA, they both agree on that rate, um, as well as special education. But there's a number of el uh, different elements within each of their proposals that are still um, off the mark where they're proposing different things. And so ultimately uh, what's gonna come down to is when the governor gets the legislature's budget, he's gonna look at it and he's gonna make the decision whether he wants to incorporate that or not. It's up to his full discretion to take what he has proposed in his May revision and not take what the legislature has proposed at all. Um, but oftentimes, or what we saw last year is uh, Governor Newsom really paid attention to what the legislature proposed in their proposal. So that's where the May revise that the governor proposed in the prior year and the legislature was much different last year and he ended up taking what the legislature ended up proposing, but we could see something different this year. It's, um, it's truly up to the governor's discretion. Uh, one thing I'll highlight at the very bottom there is that the legislature wants to double uh, the amount that was proposed towards school kitchen upgrades, as well as uh, nutrition staff development. So um, we're gonna continue to keep an eye on what actually uh, comes out from both of these budget proposals, the governor and legisl legislature. And so once we have that information, we're going to come back so that um, we're looking at the most accurate and current numbers. Next slide, please. A couple of, of reminders and assumptions. As mentioned earlier, the governor uh, has proposed that cost of living adjustment to LCFF for 5.07. In January, he was estimating 3.84%, so a slight increase um, in that uh, cost of living adjustment. The other element here that uh, is pretty important is our pension costs with STRS. Both are actually proposed to go up for the upcoming year, but STRS is currently estimated at 16.92% for next year. And that's just something that we're paying for every single employee um, that is in, in that retirement system. It's an additional 16.92% on top of their salary. And with that, that rate is an estimate right now because for the first time, the CalSTRS board has the authority to set their own rate. And on June 10th, they will be um, having their board meeting to set that uh, STRS rate. So if there's a change in that rate, then we'll try to incorporate that um, into our, our following budget report there too. Next slide, please. The assumptions that we have here are that um, we're looking at decline enrollment and this is what we're looking at for our uh, multi-year projection as well so not just in the 21-22 year but then in each subsequent year year two and year three um, that we're declining 410 scholars and this year has been extremely difficult to actually project this because you know during a pandemic year it's your enrollment uh, fluctuates all over the place so uh, you can imagine the difficulty that school districts are having trying to estimate what their enrollment will look like next year. Um, so we've tried to stay pretty um, consistent. And once we have those numbers, which we should know what our enrollment numbers are as of our CBEDS day, which is when we track that day, that's the first Wednesday of October every year. And that's um, the benchmark that we use for uh, measuring what our enrollment is. So if we have different numbers come that day, then we'll, we'll be able to update our projections and our numbers in our current uh, year estimated budget. Uh, additionally, a couple other items that uh, we generally like to budget a 5% increase for medical premiums. And um, 
I believe last year was just over 5% what the increase was. So it's a pretty um, accurate number there to use for our ongoing increases. Um, but like uh, I've probably mentioned before, those are subject to market conditions. Uh, the final element here is just that we're adjusting our staffing for declining enrollment. So, so as we do have those downturns in enrollment, we're then also looking to make sure that we're aligned with our positions to meet those needs. Next slide, please. And if um, I go too fast or if you have a question about something, feel free to interrupt me and let me know. Um, and I'll, I can double back over something too. Um, looking here, this is what the preliminary budget looks like. And we do always do a, um, a third interim comparison just to kind of show what the ending of our current year looks like or was estimated as and what the budget looks like going into the new year. Uh, oftentimes we are removing any one-time revenues and one-time expenditures um, and then also only budgeting for the uh, upcoming budget what we know our upcoming allocations are. So some restricted programs and other programs have uh, the eligibility to carry funds over. And so once we do our year end closing, that unaudited actuals report that we bring to the board, those then carry bring our carryover balances that we can add to the budget. Um, and so right now we're looking at what upcoming estimates are for um, our upcoming year allocations. And uh, you'll see that there's a decrease in a bunch of those things because we did have a lot of those one time funding um, sources, the CARES money, the CRF, the coronavirus relief funds. Um, those ones all had expenditure deadlines that were um, ending May 31st or June 30th. So um, there's some significant money that we had expended that we wouldn't be expending in the future here. And so as we get additional one time money, those will will be added into the budget, uh, but those specifics are all outlined typically in that full detailed budget report. Um, but this is where we're doing a little bit of a comparison to see what changed, you know, what, what our budget looked like at third interim and what our budget's starting to look like in the new year and seeing what some of those changes were. Next slide, please. Looking at the components of the ending fund balance, and as I like to remind, um, everyone is that the ending fund balance isn't what we have in the bank. That's not our cash balance. That is our assumption with all of our accounts receivable, all of our accounts payable, all of those th things um, add up to this ending fund balance. So um, this isn't something that we look at and say, okay, well, we, we're at, at third interim thinking that we're gonna have $28 million in cash. Cash and our budgets and actuals are, are different things. So. Um, just trying to make sure we separate those two. Um, but this ending fund balance here is going to factor in all of our um, all of our assets, all of our liabilities uh, in terms of our accounts payable, accounts receivable, and all those fun things. But one of the things that I'll outline here uh, is that our non-spendable includes in the upcoming year our prepaid um, expenditures, which is our supplemental early retirement plan. Uh, we are coming up on our fourth payment of five. And what we have to do is we typically have to pay it in uh, May and June so that we don't incur any penalties because it's due at the very beginning of July and due to our, uh, our year end closing process, it's very difficult to get a check um, printed and sent out to meet that deadline. So we pay it early, but we code it as a prepayment and then we move it into the proper expenditure account. Uh, in that new year. So just identifying that that's what that, uh, that spike there is on the non-spendable line. And then looking at uh, what our assignments are. And so typically as our assignments uh, go down, that means we're drawing down on available money that we might have. So, so there's certain assignments that we might want to do, but we can't do it based on uh, availability of funds. So looking at the Big picture there, the ending fund balance is projected at, at this point to be about 23 million. Next slide, please. And so we'll look at the full multi-year projection uh, here on our following slide. So looking at our three-year projection here, uh, I just want to outline a couple things. And one of those is gonna be the LCFF revenue drop. So you'll see a huge drop there from our first column 
to our second column, that 22-23 year, we are going to be losing that ADA, average daily attendance, hold harmless. Um, that benefit goes away uh, after the 21-22 year, and we're going to be then funded on whatever is our current um, ADA or our prior year. So uh, we will experience a drop in ADA. Now, this number could change if we have a spike in enrollment. Um, so that's where there's a lot of different variables going on there. But we are anticipating if it is consistent with what we've been experiencing, we would be seeing a drop in that revenue. Uh, additionally, um, the need for reductions is anticipated in year two here of about $8 million. And then also um, it's compounding. So any reductions that we make would then be compounding. If we make it in 21, 22, it's compounding for each year after. Um, and so we're looking at some reductions needed in the second year and the third year in order for us to meet that board 5% um, reserve. Uh, and what this really means is that we're going to continue to certify our budget as a qualified budget. And the impact of that is that um, when we go out for bonding, that does affect our credit rating, um, which then affects interest rates and our ability to sell those bonds. So. Um, that's where, you know, obviously, if, if we're able to make the necessary reductions that we can and get to that positive budget, it just has a, a better impact in the long term. So um, looking at that, we'll move to our next slide. And this is like we talked about the multi-year, we looked at expenditures and revenues. We'll look at those components of the ending fund balance again here. Um, and you'll see here, like I mentioned, the non-spendable that prepaid money, we remove it in the out years because that's not something that um, is projected for an ongoing thing. It's usually just uh, a one-time thing to bridge us into the new year so that we can make sure we meet the, uh, the invoice timelines for that specific uh, situation. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, when we don't have enough money in the assigned, that means we really are drawing down on that because of some of the deficit spending. So um, you'll see here in years two and three, there is no longer any funding uh, available in our assigned balances. So um, that money is drawn upon to make sure that we can try to um, embrace some of the impacts of those deficits. And the next slide, please. So what we're looking for for our next steps is that we're going to be continuing to incorporate any changes. So any changes with our LCAP, we'll then want to reflect that also with our budget. Uh, so if, if we're looking at different positions, new positions or anything like that, we want to make sure that we incorporate that in the budget because the LCAP and the budget go tandem together, hand in hand. And so we're going to continue to monitor other elements like what's going on between the, the governor's budget uh, or the governor and the legislature. And then also things like STRS and what their board approves for those pension rates. Um, but we will bring the adopted uh, final adopted budget to the board for approval on June 22nd. So this is, is just going to be our first read of uh, looking at the numbers. Um, but then as we also have uh, our year end closing happening through July, August, and then um, bringing that report in September, we'll then have different balances, some carryover balances that we might be able to add, but that's typically for our restricted pro programs. So um, just keeping that in mind that those are our restricted programs like Title I, um, like well, basically all those federal title pro programs, and uh, additionally like some CTIG, those types of grants as well. Um, but as we always do, we're going to work with our county office, make sure that we have transparency and that they are looking at our budget as well and that they know the assumptions that we've um, that we've made, but then uh, making sure that we're reporting everything to both our board and our county offices so that uh, everybody is on the same page and we all have the same elements that we're looking at. Thanks, Timothy. Any, any questions or um, any other items? This was the final part. Theoretically, if the governor didn't adopt the legislature's budget, then we would be running off the previous year's budget. But we'd still have the 38% allocation for us for Prop 98. Is that accurate? Um, he would. He has to actually uh, adopt a budget by July 1st. So what he could do is he could say, uh, I appreciate the legislature's attempt, 
but I'm going to go forward with what I proposed in my May proposal. And so if that happens, then we would want to make sure that all of our assumptions are based on that May revise. And that's typically why we try to focus a little bit on the May revise uh, opposed to what the legislature always proposes, because ultimately he has that authority to say, I just, I'm going with my, my budget. And, and Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown, he was notorious for what he was bringing to the table was what was going to the table. And there was only some minor changes that were happening because he was trying to address a lot of state structural issues. And he built up basically the rainy day fund uh, for the state to kind of stabilize some of those uh, state of California's finances. So um, it, ultimately it could be what the governor uh, proposed in May as, as what goes. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to close the public hearing. Do we have any public comments? Not on this item. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing at 8.58 p.m. And we're moving on to another related item, obviously. Item 11B, the first reading of the proposed 2021-2022 preliminary budget, which is what you just saw from Timothy. Um, I'll Move adoption. Motion. All right, I'll Move second. Adoption. We got a first and a second. Any questions or discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. One more item under business, 11C, adoption of resolution number 46 for the 2021 school year. Establish a building fund and a debt service fund. Thank you, Dr. Begin. In November 2020, Oceanside voters passed Measure W to provide monies to finance the construction of school facilities. Due to the approval of this new bond, it is necessary to create special funds in the district's finance system. School districts are authorized by Ed Code to establish a restricted fund known as the building fund. In addition, pursuant to California code, a debt service fund must also be established after issuing and selling the bonds. The building fund will receive, hold, and invest and disperse funds for the various construction projects to be determined. The debt service fund will receive levied taxes with which bond payments will be made. It is recommended the board adopt resolution number 46 to establish the two new restricted funds. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll yep. second. I have a first and a second. Any questions or discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Thank you. Moving on to 12, policy development. Item 12A, I believe we have public comment for this as well. 12A, adoption of resolution number 45. 2021, Supporting Safe Gun Storage. Yes, this item uh, was an item requested by uh, Trustee Joyce for us to bring forward. And ultimately it's a, a resolution for the board to consider on um, uh, safe gun storage uh, for parents and guardians and families. And ultimately uh, what it would direct the um, staff to do is to create an appropriate letter uh, that we would post uh, on our website informing uh, parents and guardians um, how to safely store guns. Um, and there's a lot of rationale for that listed on the resolution. And I believe Trustee Joyce may want to speak to this. Because it's a brief, <laughs> it is a shorter um, resolution, I can do the read through faster than before. So I'll, I'll give it my best. Um, <laughs> Whereas student safety continues to be one of the highest priorities for Oceanside Unified School District Board of Trustees. And whereas having a firearm in the home that is easily accessible to children increases firearm related injuries, deaths and crimes, including teen suicide, creating significant local and national public health impacts. And whereas safety, uh, safely locking up or disabling firearms when they are not in the owner's immediate control is highly effective 
in reducing gun violence and has been found to be the single most effective gun safety measure enacted by states and municipalities. And whereas data from the CDC and uh, prevention indicates that from 1999 through 2017, the most recent years available, an average of 65 children less than 15 years of age were unintentionally shot and killed in the US each year. Whereas in California from 1999 to 2017, an average of 27 children under the age of 18 have died by suicide with a gun each year. Whereas often the gun used in a youth suicide belongs to a family a member or parent. And whereas 87% of children know where their, ch where their parents' guns are kept, 60% have handled them and over 80% of teens who commit suicide with a gun used one that belonged to someone in their home. Whereas approximately 20% of adults in California possess a firearm and state and local law criminalizes unsafe storage of firearms where minors may be present while gun retailers are required to post flyers that set forth state safe storage requirements. There are no dedicated resources for educating adults about the safe storage of firearms. So now that let, therefore let it be resolved that the board directs superintendent to create an appropriate letter to parents and guardians explaining the importance of safe gun storage and the legal obligations to protect minors from negligent gun storage to be posted in the district website under parent resources and be it additionally resolved that the board and superintendent will continue to work with local law enforcement agencies health agencies and nonprofits to collaborate to inform district parents of their duty to safely store firearms in their homes and be it further resolved that the Unified School, Oceanside Unified School District on this eighth day of June, 2021, hereby pass and adopt the resolution. So board members, colleagues, I, I ask for your support in this resolution that's extremely important. Um, one child lost to negligent uh, storage of firearms is one too many, so thank you. Thanks, Eric, for reading that. I do believe we have two public comments for this item. We do, Andrea D. and Stephanie Wells. All right, we'll start with Andrea D. Welcome, Andrea, you have three minutes. Thank you to the board for your time. Again, my name is Andrea D. I'm a resident of Oceanside with two children who attended school at OU OUSD from kindergarten through their senior years as an active PTO mom and volunteered many hours at my schools. Additionally, I taught for two years as a credentialed teacher in the district, and I'm currently a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm speaking in support of Agenda Item 12A, the resolution supporting safe gun storage and asking the board to create an appropriate letter to parents and guardians that explains the importance of safe gun storage and the legal obligations to protect minors from negligent gun storage. On November 20th, 2019, the California Department of Education sent an urgent request to all county and district superintendents and charter school administrators directing them to educate parents and guardians about California's child access prevention laws. It is a crime for a person to negligently store or leave a loaded firearm in a place where a child is likely to access it. But laws are only effective if parents and other citizens are aware of the law. The COVID-19 crisis has also created new challenges for parents. Stress and isolation may pose additional risks to a child's safety. Securing all guns in the home, storing them locked, unloaded, and separated from ammunition can save a child's life. Unintentional shootings, deaths by children increased by 31%, comparing incidents in March to December of 2020 to the same months in 2019. And a study from the CDC found that a quarter of young adults have contemplated suicide during the pandemic. This all comes at a time when the U.S. has seen a surge in gun sales, driving by, driven by fear and anxiety during COVID-19 pandemic. People bought an estimated 22 million guns, a 64% increase in 2019. By taking this action, you can help reduce the risk of death and accidents in our community. I urge the board to adopt this resolution. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Andrea. Our next speaker is Stephanie. Hi, good evening. My name is Stephanie Wells and I'm the local group lead for North County Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm in support of the district adopting the safe storage of firearms resolution. 
Given it's the beginning of summer and kids will have more free time, this, urgent, this is an urgent matter to address. 41% of students in gun-owning homes report having easy access to guns. Adopting this resolution and informing parents of their responsibility can help reduce unintentional shootings and suicide. In a mental health crisis, means matter, and reducing access to highly lethal means can be the difference between life and death. As a community, we are safer when guns are stored, unloaded, locked, and separate from ammunition. Households that lock both firearms and ammunition separately were associated with a 78% lower risk of self-inflicted firearm injuries and an 85% lower risk of unintentional firearm injuries among children. Please adopt this resolution and help keep Oceanside students safe. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I think that's all for our public comment. Um, I will call for a motion. I'll make a motion that we adopt this resolution. Did you second it, Eric? I didn't hear you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, second. so Sorry. we have a first and second. Any comments or discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of the resolution for supporting safe gun storage, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. And thank you for the advocacy, our moms demanding action. <laughs> Great work. All right, next one, item 12B, adoption of resolution number 47 for 2021. Recognition of LB, LGBTQ plus Pride Month, June, 2021. Yes, this is a resolution that we recommend the Board of Education uh, support declaring uh, June, 2020 LGBTQ uh, Pride Month. Uh, as you are very aware, as demonstrated through several actions tonight, the district is committed to providing a safe place for all students, including our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning community or those that may be perceived as such. Um, I urge the board to vote uh, in support of this resolution. And I believe uh, Trustee Alvarez would like to speak to the resolution. Thank you. I'd actually like to read the resolution if possible. Um, uh, whereas the Oceanside Unified School District advocates and promotes the safe, inclusive and respectful treatment of all our students as part of the district's social emotional support, whereas the district is committed to providing a safe space for all students, including the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, LGBTQ plus community, or those that may be perceived as such. Whereas the California Education Code section 200 ensures that all students receive equal access to rights to educational opportunities in public schools. Whereas the Oceanside Unified School District commits to, to the implementation of the fair <clears throat> the Fair Education Act into K-12 grade history and social studies curriculum, whereas the month of June is an opportunity to highlight the identities and contributions of the LGBTQ plus community and June 2021 in particular marks the 52nd annual anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, which highlighted and served a catalyst for the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights. Whereas the sexual orientation and gender expression, bias bullying is among the most common form of harassment in schools whereas peer harassment and bullying contribute to significant higher rates of school, dropout, academic failure, and school disengagement among LGBTQ plus youth. Whereas LG LGBTQ plus youth are more likely to experience a mental health condition and a greater risk of suicide and deserve our vocal acceptance and support, as well as special attention to the unique challenges they may face in school and in their communities. Whereas the Board of Education adopted a board policy on gender identity and access during the February 11, 2020 board meeting, which further outlines the services, supports, and protections <clears throat> provided to such students and families. Whereas the Board of Education recognizes and rejects the shameful history and present day manifestations of bias against oppression of LGBTQ plus individuals and heartily and heartily celebrates each LGBTQ plus student and staff as valued members of the Oceanside community. And whereas by recognizing Pride Month, we support other policies, practices, and curricula that honor and respect LGBTQ plus students, staff, and their families. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Oceanside Unified School Board of Education declares June 2021 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month and directs the superintendent and all district staff to continue supporting lessons, activities, and conversations that engage students in meaningful learning, 
research and writing about the LGBTQ plus students and families. Thank you, Raquel, for reading that. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Oh, second. We have a person second. Right, do, I'll call for do we have do we have the capability of um, raising a pride flag here at the district office for the month of June? If so, requested by the Board of Education, I believe I could obtain uh, a pride flag and um, display it properly uh, with the American flag. I would request that yes. if, if, if there's consent. Consensus. Was that, was, that, was that direction from the board to do that? You don't really have to vote on that. You can give me direction underneath this uh, item. That would be fine. Great. All right, so I have a first and a second. I'm gonna call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. All right, the next couple of items are gonna go pretty quickly because they're each revisions to board policy. So we'll start with item C. Approval of revisions to board policy 1113, district and school websites. Matthew. Yes, good evening again, board. Uh, this item just updates um, our last policy around websites that was approved back in 2010. Uh, this is new language from CSBA and it just clarifies uh, language around our design standards, website content and privacy rights. Updated language. Thanks, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a first and a second. Any questions? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to the next policy, 12D, approval of revision of board policy 4112.2 certification. Hi, similarly, this has new language in board policy and those changes are highlighted for the board to see. For this particular item, there's three um, areas that are addressed. The first has to do with um, hiring highly qualified teachers. And in the instances that one's not available, the criteria that we use to look for teachers and provide time for them and coverage through waiver programs, like we just did earlier with the EL authorization that we did. Uh, in addition, it also has language for um, the board to, um, uh, when issuing emergency permits uh, to annually approve the declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Um, the second item has to do with no the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards Certification. And this one has to do with some language on how the district can support NBPTS, uh, which we do in ways in terms of um, helping with those that are pursuing that program with reimbursing for registration as well as providing bonuses and pay for those that achieve that distinction. And the final item on this one is parent notification. Since the district is in receipt of Title I funding, uh, there are um, requirements for the district to provide information to parents that request teacher qualifications or licensing. In addition, if a teacher is assigned to a classroom for more than four weeks, uh, the district has an obligation to notify parents of the credential status of those employees. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. I um, will make a motion to approve. I'll second. Just to make a quick comment, um, our district is stellar compared to other districts in the state, the way we support national board certification and accomplished teaching. We're the only district that I know of that helps the teachers with paying for the process, as well as um, a bonus at the end of the process. And the governor, exciting news in his budget, has put a whole bunch of money towards possibly having stipends, and we'll see how that pans out, to support more people going through the process and working at um, lower performing schools. So. Thank you for highlighting that, Dr. Began. We do have a great program in this district. Yeah, super. Um, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Next item, 12E, revision to board policy 5131.7, weapons and dangerous instruments. Yes, thank you, Dr. Begin. Um, similar to what Dr. McTeer and Mr. Jennings uh, shared, this is just part of our ongoing process to bring board policies current with some revised language. This particular board policy change um, 
deletes material specifying the term of suspension or expulsion of students who violate the policy around weapons and dangerous instruments on campus. And it's also uh, repeated in the administrative regulations around suspension and expulsion and due process. The regulation also reflects law prohibiting the carrying of ammunition or reloaded ammunition onto school grounds without the permission of the superintendent or designee. Um, this reflects the changes that were made to the Senate Bill 1080 in 2010, which it went into effect in 2012. Thanks, Dr. Sparks. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Any questions, discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Next one, item 12F, approval of replacement of board policy 3515.4, recovery for property loss or damage. Thank you, Dr. Begin. Uh, this policy was last revised May 11th of 2010. The policy is being updated to reflect the 2019 limits for parent guardian liability for property loss or damage caused by a child's willful misconduct and for any reward paid for information leading to the identification of persons responsible for the damage. Most importantly, the update also reflects the new law AB 1974, which prohibits the collection of debt owed by a current or former homeless or foster youth. Thank you, Dr. Norman. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, we have a first and a second. Any questions for Dr. Norman? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Last one tonight, 12G, approval of replacement of board policy 7210, facilities financing. Thank you. This policy was last updated May 11th of 2010. This policy is being updated to add state facilities funding from the Leroy F. Green School Facilities Act as a method of funding facilities. So this is not on our current policy, we're gonna be adding it. It's an application process. So it just adds to the list of different ways um, that we can possibly finance our facilities. In addition, it reflects the new law SB 820, which requires filing the audit of completed facilities projects with the California State Controller. This update also adds the requirement to comply with the law and board policy regarding debt issuance and management. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the proposed replacement to board policy 7210 facilities financing. I'll move approval. I'll second. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to my favorite part, item 13, public comments on non-agenda items. And I think we have three of those this evening. We have four, but I think only one person is present. So right. uh, David Fogliotti, Stephen Sly, Laura Schaefer, and then Lita Esposito. All right. So, David, I'm going to say Fagulati, you are first. I just wanted to give you a friendly reminder. You have three minutes for public comment. Sounds good. Thank you for your time. Uh, appreciate hearing all of your feedback. So I'm a high school teacher at uh, Oceanside High School. I'm a science and CT instructor. I've been there for the past 15 years and spoken to the board in the past. I wanted to update uh, all of you on our master schedule work group consisting of department chairs, site representatives, and our common instructional practices team. Uh, this 10-person work group began three weeks ago uh, to determine the level of site consensus at OHS for a traditional two-day block or four-day block schedule for the 21-22 school year. Uh, all of the example schedules we looked at uh, maintained our current six courses divided over two semesters, uh, the seven and a half hour work, work day for instructors, uh, one minimum day for PLC meetings, uh, 40 minutes per day, 
per day before or after school for teachers, seven minute passing periods and 30 minute lunches. That's just a long way to say that we uh, maintained a, the similar contract agreement that we're currently working under. So it's no changes to our FTEs or our current uh, contract uh, accepting the, uh, the break every day, the prep. So uh, to determine site consensus, two anonymous paper polls were conducted for all certificate, certificated staff at OHS. The first poll was to select either the two or four day block schedule to appear on the final ballot. Uh, uh, in the first poll, we had a 95% participation rate with 66 uh, staff in favor of the four day block and 32 in favor of the two day block. Uh, so based on this first ballot, uh, we placed the four day block versus a traditional schedule on a final ballot. This was just done last week. Uh, we wrapped up polling on Friday. And for the final ballot, we had a 97% participation with 79 in favor of the four day block and 21 opposed. Uh, I'm sorry. And 21 for the traditional schedule. This poll shows we have almost an 80% consensus for the four day block schedule for the 21 22 school year for our certificated staff. This represents a huge shift from our previous polls dating back to 2016 and 18, comparing five by threes, four by fours, and a traditional bell schedule. In these previous polls, no schedules they would generate more than a 50% site consensus. Uh, a presentation with the specific uh, minutes for each bell schedule and polling results has been provided to our site administration and Dr. Lawrence. Uh, the message this work group consistently heard from our certificated staff was that next year is still an emergency. The proposed four day block represents an incremental shift from a traditional schedule that allows uh, such things as daily target intervention. Uh, it allows students to focus on three classes instead of six and it supports uh, the 80% preference the students have said to a block schedule. Uh, our group looks forward to working with you uh, over in this, in this extraordinary time to meet the needs of our students for the 21-22 school year. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. You're welcome. So our next speaker. I'd like to begin the other three speakers that applied, um, none are in the room. There are no more public comments. Okay. All right, with that said, we move to item 14. Any last closing comments from our board members? None for me, I'm still in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Literally and probably figuratively. <laughs> Don't hurt yourself. All right. we're, we're doing fine. I just want to thank everybody, our families, because I know it's the end of the year. Everybody's going crazy with promotions and graduations and everything else. I want to thank our community, our families, our staff, um, our administrators, our teachers, or everybody. I just want to thank everyone for just continuing to be there to be supportive of each other as we continue and go on into the summer with our summer school classes, because those seem to already sound amazing and look amazing and I'm just I'm thankful for the work that everybody has put in together it's it takes a village and we have definitely become a village that is very close and um and I thank you all for that I thank you for just the support again for each other that we continue to have I want to continue it I look forward to the next school year um and what that brings and even our I just I look forward actually to our summer programs and seeing what that that is for all our students. So again, thank you everybody for just an amazing school year for our students who just push through as you graduate and you continue to go on. Um, congratulations. As you, you go through your promotions, your graduations and everything else that you're going to be going through. I look forward to the next adventures as you just show off who Oceanside Unified is in your life and where you're going and your, your true success. So thank you and congratulations to everybody. Well said, Raquel. Anyone else? All right, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 9.26 p.m. Good night, everyone. Thank you for Hi, your everyone. time. Good night. Great job. Nice work, guys. <laughs>